Imagine sitting in a prison cell and contemplating life, and how it will be all over quite soon. You're going to be executed by way of hanging, and no doubt you're wondering how that will go. You hope it'll be quick. It's not so much oblivion that scares you, but the fact that hanging might not go exactly as it should, and you'll spend some seconds or even minutes in agonizing pain. It wouldn't be the first time a man has been left dangling with life still in him. One thing you're not considering at all is the possibility of surviving your execution, never mind surviving three attempts to execute you. Welcome to the life of John Lee, the criminal they just couldn't kill. Before we get to the momentous moment in history that tainted the image of the British authorities, and before we investigate the theories as to why the job at hand failed, you need to know a bit about hanging in the first place. That way you might better understand how John Lee escaped with his life intact. Prior to the British getting a bit more humane about this method of execution, it was quite brutal, albeit likely a better way to go than past forms of execution such as being burned or boiled or torn apart at the limbs. Hanging in the old days might have involved climbing onto something and then having your neck put inside a noose. Then the object is taken from under the person and they die from strangulation. In the 19th century, scientists aired their views and said dislocating the neck was a more humane way to kill someone than strangulation on a rope. In 1866, the idea was proposed to drop the person from a certain height to ensure this quick snap and ensuing death. This method was called a standard drop. At the time, a scientist named Samuel Houghton said the height of the drop to secure a fast death should be between 4 and 6 feet. That way, there would be no dangling in terrible discomfort. The standard drop was soon seen as backwards due to the fact that it didn't take into account a person's height and weight. In 1872, a new method was introduced that was called the long drop. The person was connected to a noose and stood on a scaffold, which had a trap door. When the door was opened, down fell the body. The authorities had to calculate the proportions of the person's body so that the neck would snap and kill the person quickly, but not drop the person so much that he or she would be decapitated. This can and has happened, and while death is death, losing the head was not something anyone wanted to see. So that's where we were around the time a Mr. John Lee is going to go to the scaffold. On November 15, 1884, he murdered a woman named Emma Ann Whitehead Keys. This happened in a small village called Babacombe, which is in Devon in the south of England. Lee was arrested, but always protested that he was innocent of the crime. But there was some evidence to the contrary, including a knife wound that he had incurred during the murder. The woman had been killed with a knife. Prior to her downfall, Keyes had lived alone with her servants and cooks, and Lee had once worked there too. He left that job, joined the Navy, returned to Devon, and was arrested for stealing. After his release from prison, he returned to the manor and worked for Keyes again. It was perhaps a bad move on her part to take him back in. When she was found dead, there had only been one person in the house at the time, and that was Lee. Then there was the cut on his arm which pointed at his guilt. Besides that, there wasn't really anything else the police had on him, and in 1884, there was no CSI Devon. Maybe it wasn't him who had committed the murder, and he certainly thought he'd been falsely convicted. He once said, the reason I'm so calm is that I trust in the Lord and he knows I'm innocent. He was sentenced to be hanged at Exeter Prison on the 23rd of February 1884. On the day of the event, the executioner named James Barry went through the checks. Scaffold, all good. Noose, correctly tied. Trap door, working fine. What could possibly go wrong? All we know is that Lee was taken to the scaffold and his head was fastened to the noose. A white hood was put over his head, and when the signal was given, the trap door didn't open. They tried again, and then again. And you can only imagine what was going through Lee's mind after each time he gritted his teeth and prepared for the great unknown. This was a total embarrassment for anyone involved, and the medical officer said enough is enough. He said he can't hang around any longer after those failures. Lee was unfastened from the noose the last time and was taken back to prison. But what actually went wrong since the entire apparatus had been tested? Well, the executioner wrote about the experience as well as some other 130 plus executions in a book called My Experiences as an Executioner. He admitted in that book that the science didn't always work and some men died too slowly or lost their heads. But Lee's case was extraordinary. These are two excerpts from that book. One, on the Saturday I examined this drop and reported it was much too frail for its purpose, but I worked the lever and found that the doors dropped all right. Two, the noise of the bolt sliding could be plainly heard, but the doors did not fall. I stamped on the drop to shake it loose, and so did some of the warders, but none of our efforts could stir it. Lee stood like a statue, making no sound or sign. Between each attempt, they actually took Lee away. He had the hood removed from his head and was taken to a room. The authorities then tried the trapdoor mechanism again, and it worked fine. Lee was brought back out, fastened in the noose, hood put over his head, and they tried it again. It didn't work, three times in all. 
By golly, thought the authorities, the entire experience was frighteningly perturbing and just a little bit disturbing. Executioner Barry wrote that some people believed there was a possibility of the trapdoor being swollen by the rain, but he added that they even cut the door with an axe and a plane and it still didn't work when it needed to. In the end, he concluded that it was the iron catches that had somehow stuck when Lee's weight was on the trapdoor. It was one of the low points of his career. The British Home Secretary, Sir William Harcourt, commuted Lee's sentence, saying it would shock the feeling of anyone if a man had twice to pay the pangs of imminent death. Lee ended up serving 22 years behind bars. The thing is, investigations years later show that Lee might not have been the only person in the house that night and he might have been wrongly convicted. Maybe there really was some divine intervention on his part. What's also a mystery is what happened to Lee after he was released. No one really knows, since he just kind of disappeared. Some rumors suggest he kept his head down and he moved to London, while others say he moved abroad. More recent research suggests that he went over the pond and that his grave is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That research asserts that he had abandoned his wife and two kids in England and started a new life in the States. It's possible he was buried there in 1945. You've got your story straight. You've spent months prepping to go undercover and infiltrate the Italian-American Mafia. You are no longer named Joseph Pistone, and from now on you'll only answer to a name the crew calls you. You've got a fake driver's license that bears that name, and you've got swagger befitting a gangster. You know how to use that Mafia twang and say, how you doing, and forget about it in just the right way. You're going to try and fool some of the most dangerous criminals in the world and bring them down. That will mean seeing some disturbing things, and as you move through this new life, every day could be your last. This is the story of one of the biggest lies the FBI ever told, the story of a man who was once known as Donnie Brasco. Joseph Joe Pistone was the right fit for an undercover cop who would infiltrate an Italian-American crime family. He was part Sicilian, grew up in New Jersey where the mafia presence was strong, and so he had the background and knew the patois of those gangsters. He looked the part, sounded the part, and when the time came, he was ready to be a wise guy. In fact, a much wiser guy than the wise guys he worked with. His early life didn't consist of petty crime and fighting in the mean streets of New Jersey. He studied hard, attained a degree in anthropology, and later went to work for naval intelligence. It wasn't until 1969, when he was 30 years old, that he started working for the FBI. Five years later, he was moving to New York when he joined the truck hijacking unit, with hijacking trucks being a big money spinner for the mafia. Sometimes the truck drivers were in on it too, and took payment and maybe a black eye for a payoff. Hundreds of trucks were getting done over and millions of dollars of items were being stolen. It didn't really matter what the bounty was, it could all be sold on. In 1974, when Pistone joined that unit, the truck hijacking business was bringing in $4.2 million a year. Something had to be done. But it wasn't the truck hijacking that made Pistone a well-regarded name in the FBI. It was when he went undercover for the first time and brought down a vehicle theft ring. 30 people were arrested and the FBI knew they had a man they could use. It was 1976 when Pistone put his hand up and said he was willing to go undercover again, but this time the assignment was about as dangerous as could be. He said he'd infiltrate one of the five families that ran New York City's criminal underworld. That was the Bonanno crime family. He spoke Italian fluently, including the street slang of the gangsters. He'd grown up among them and had a Sicilian heritage, and as he proved, he could work well undercover. There wasn't really a better man for the job. He just needed to create a backstory, and that meant everything, from fictional fights he had in high school and how much he loved his grandmother's pasta con lasarde and mouth-watering casata siciliana. He had the known names in the mafia and how the organization worked. He had made up past loves, he had been kicked around the tough streets, and that's how he got into crime. His principal income was jewel thievery, and if you're a jewel thief, you have to know a thing or two about jewels. This was a tricky part of the backstory, and Pistone had to spend some time studying gemology. He passed with bright flying colors. His name was erased. He was expunged from history. There was no Joe Pistone now, only Donnie Brasco, the jewel thief. It was intended that he'd stay this way for six months. But as you'll see, things didn't quite work out that way. One day, this man named Donnie turned up in Little Italy. He frequented restaurants and hung out in bars. He always seemed to have a lot of cash on him. And while he didn't immediately tell the folks he met why this was, he did get particularly friendly with a barman at one place. Then he let it be known that he had jewels and he knew where he could get more jewels. He was useful to any criminal empire. 
With all the cash he had, he was obviously pretty good at his job. You have to think about how dangerous this was. It wasn't as if he was working in Alaska. He could have easily been spotted by someone he knew, and if met on the street and called Joe, he was done for. To prevent anyone from letting the story out, only a few people in the FBI knew about the operation, while his co-workers just thought he'd moved on someplace. His own friends didn't know where he'd gone. The man was a ghost. He couldn't be seen to be big time, otherwise someone would have already heard of him. But the act was that while he was small time, he could certainly get involved with bigger things and likely earn for a family. It actually took about six months before he got a break and was introduced to someone from the Colombo crime family. There he started working for Jilly Greca and his crew, an outfit that got most of their money from stealing and hijacking. This wasn't really the higher echelons of mafia crews, but it was a start. The funny thing is, because he was so undercover, the New York cops soon had a file on him. That file said he was a crook and a new addition to the Greca crew, named Don Brasco. Then he got another break and met a man with a violent temper and a will to kill. That man was Anthony Tony Mira, and he was part of the Bonanno crime family. Now things got serious because Tony was known for his temper. It's thought he killed 30 to 40 people during his criminal career. Brasco worked more closely with other members of the family, including Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano and Benjamin Lefty Guns Ruggiero. He developed a close friendship with the latter, and this is how the many exploits of the Mafia got back to the FBI. During this time, life was filled with patches of boredom and loneliness. Months and years passed and he had no real friends or anyone to love or confide in. It was a dangerous job, but one of the worst aspects of working undercover was basically not being able to be you and enjoy unadulterated emotions. When it came to the more dangerous side of this life, Brasco was never involved in things like big shootouts and he never had to whack a guy. He just played a part, stayed in character, and listened. Of course, he had to witness violence though. Unlike some undercover agents that would follow, Brasco never lost sight of who he was. While he acted well, he was always aware that he was an FBI agent and his friendships were not real. He might laugh and joke around with them and the laughter wasn't fake, but he also knew that one bad move would mean those guys laughing with him would fix him a pair of cement boots and send him for a swim in the Hudson. He also had a wife and kids who depended on him. They knew nothing about what he was doing and he only got to see them once every few months. At one point, he had a car trunk filled with Christmas gifts and was about to go home to his family, but then he bumped into some of his crew and they took him out on a wild night. He had to play the part. The guys in this crew thought Donnie was a bachelor and would be spending Christmas alone in his room. They sympathized with the man. They even visited him at his room and brought a surprise Christmas tree, after which they helped him decorate it. What are you going to do? It's Christmas time. Bada bing, bada boom. There was even one time when Brasco's wife had a near-fatal car accident and he had to go missing for several days. Upon returning, he couldn't show sadness and had to make up a story as to where he'd been. One of the scariest aspects of the job as time went by was when he was summoned to a mob meeting. Every single time he showed up, he wondered if his real identity had been exposed and he would get whacked there and then. On another occasion, he and Lefty were blamed for messing up a job and he could have been taken out for that, but instead they let him off. Brasco ended up in Florida, where he ran quite a successful operation. At this point, the ill-tempered Mira had just gotten out of jail and discovered that Brasco was making a lot of cash. He demanded part of that, seeing as it was him that gave him his start. This was also a troublesome time when lives were on the line. But when he was alone with Sonny or Lefty, much of the time they just lived like normal friends. They didn't always talk about mafia stuff. You have to remember, this went on for years and years. And while movies or TV might depict Brasco's life as being crime 24 hours a day, it just wasn't like that. Most of the time was spent sitting at home watching TV or going to the bar and playing cards. Brasco didn't know too much about the inner workings of the crime family because he wasn't a made man. You know, what you need to know is how the Mafia dealt with things. They knew very well that in New York City you are never more than a few feet away from a rat. From time to time things slipped though, and a big break for Brasco is when Sonny told him about three captains that had been whacked. They'd been told to come to a meeting, and when they got there they were shot by Lefty and other men. Sonny was now confiding in Brasco, which was good and bad. The downside to becoming a closer member of the family was doing what family members did, and that was dealing in violence and sometimes murder. Sonny said to Brasco, I need you to take out a person, but you know what? I'm going to try and make you a made man. You'll be one of us. We're going to make some serious money. He was now in too deep for his own good. One, because killing someone was too extreme an act to follow, and two, because now he was so close to Sonny, he was a target for the people he was supposedly warring against. He might get taken out both as a wise guy and in the line of duty. It was too much. The FBI pulled him out. 
The aftermath was, to say the least, chaotic, and at first Brasco's old crew didn't believe the truth. They thought this was some kind of wicked lie, a trap laid by the FBI. They soon discovered it wasn't a lie, and Donnie Brasco, their friend and associate, had never existed. Sonny was soon murdered for getting too close to Brasco and not unearthing the truth. Lefty ended up in prison. Mira went to hiding. But things weren't looking too good because the Bonanno family boss, one Joseph Massino, had ordered his murder. A mafia soldier named Joseph D'Amico did the business in the end, shooting him a few times in the head. Ironically, D'Amico would also later become an informant. As for what happened during the job, his friendships made. Pistone once said, I had no sense of guilt. All during the course of the operation, I knew it was a job. He did later say, though, that he didn't want his old comrades to be killed. He only wanted them imprisoned. The Mafia put a $500,000 contract out in Pistone's life, and to counter what some people believe, he says it's never been rescinded. He and his family live with false names, which they change occasionally. No one knows where they are, and they certainly stay away from locations where there is a Mafia presence. Time might have passed, but Pistone believes there will be some big shot out there who wants to say he was the man who took down the FBI's most famous undercover cop. January 26, 1991, night, the Iraqi desert. Two SUVs barrel across the moon-bright desert toward Chris. He crouches low, getting into position. His body shakes from the wild pounding of his heart. He breathes deep and thinks of his two-year-old daughter. His hand steadies. The vehicles are closer now, 55 yards away, then 40 yards, 30 yards. At 20 yards, he pulls the trigger. A rocket whooshes from the launcher. The first SUV explodes with a heavy bang, thick smoke billowing up. Chris launches a grenade at the second SUV, nailing its hood. Then he pops up and charges toward the vehicles, spraying bullets in case there's anyone still alive in the wreckage. Satisfied that he won't be chased anymore, Chris turns and runs until it feels like his heart is going to burst. For now, he's escaped the enemy. He doesn't know if anyone else in his patrol is alive or dead. His only chance for survival is to walk across the desert and cross into Syria. It was supposed to be a straightforward mission. During build-up to the ground invasion of Iraq, B Squadron of the 22nd SAS is stationed at a forward operating base in Al-Juf, Saudi Arabia. Three eight-man patrols, Bravo 1-0, Bravo 2-0, and Bravo 3-0, are to infiltrate deep into Iraqi territory on intelligence-gathering missions. The main task of Bravo 2 is to find a good lying-up position and set up an observation post to monitor the main supply route, or MSR, that runs between the town of Hatida and three airfields. It's thought that the Iraqi army is moving Scud missile launchers along this route. The patrol is to report on enemy movements via radio or satcom. After 10 days, a chopper will resupply them or move them to a new location. Bravo 2 consists of Patrol Commander Sergeant Andy McNabb, Sergeant Vince Phillips, Corporal Chris Ryan, Lance Corporal Dinger Pring, and troops Bob Concilio, Legs Lane, Stan McGowan, and Mark Cover. On the night of January 22nd, an RAF Chinook drops the soldiers into the Iraqi desert. Unlike the other two patrols, Bravo 2 opts to travel on foot instead of bringing vehicles. It's a decision they'll soon regret. The mission gets off to a rough start. The desert's colder than expected. It's hard work moving their heavy equipment. They've misjudged the terrain from poor, outdated maps. Bravo 2 soon realizes that the spot they're in is hot. There's an anti-aircraft encampment less than a quarter of a mile away. Legs, the patrol's radio man, has trouble contacting command on the radio. The day after their insertion, Bravo 2 is compromised, when a young goat herder stumbles upon them and then alerts other people. In the afternoon, the patrol finds themselves hunkered down in a wadi or a dry river channel. From about 219 yards away on a bluff, two Iraqi men watch them. It's a tense moment, and then Chris makes a bad mistake. He waves. It's meant to be a disarming gesture, but he waves with his left hand, which is offensive in Arab culture. The men instantly begin firing their weapons. Bravo 2 returns fire and the situation rapidly deteriorates. The Iraqis are quickly joined by a dump truck full of men with AK-47s. As the firefight rages on, the patrol retreats further down the riverbed, struggling under the weight of their heavy haversacks while shooting and trying to evade getting shot. Chris activates his Tactical Rescue Beacon, or TACB, and yells that they're under attack. Andy also activates his TACB. Though their beacons are set to different frequencies to alert both the US and SAS forces, neither gets a response. Bravo 2 ditches their biggest packs so they move faster. Legs leaves behind radio equipment. At the last minute, Chris runs almost 20 yards back to get a hip flask his wife had given him as a present out of his discarded pack. 
Miraculously, the patrol escapes the Iraqi fighters. They regroup some distance away. Amazingly, no one had been hit, but they lost a lot of their gear. Not sure if their communications have gone through, they decide not to wait for a rescue to show up and head for the Syrian border. As dusk falls, Bravo 2 detours and doubles back through the rough, rocky terrain in case they're being followed. Then they walk south. Periodically, Mark switches on his GPS to get a fix on a satellite. They then check their maps to determine which way to go. After walking for several hours, Stan collapses. He has on thermal underwear and the fast pace has caused him to sweat hard. He's dehydrated. Chris, who's trained as a medic, gives him rehydrate powder mixed into water. Some of the others want to find a safe hiding spot and leave Stan behind, but Chris won't allow it. He cajoles and threatens the semi-conscious Stan into continuing to walk. When they venture near the MSR, fearing discovery, Chris sets an even more punishing walking pace. Stan and Vince keep up with the rest of them. After about an hour, they pause to consult which way to go and discover that the rest of the patrol, Andy, Bob, Mark, Legs, and Dinger, are missing. From higher ground, they pause to look out over the desert floor, but don't see the missing soldiers. Chris turns on his tackbeat, and to see if by chance Andy has his on, they'd be able to communicate. Unfortunately, there's no answer. The patrol is down to three soldiers. Chris, Stan, and Vince walk on, occasionally trying to contact Andy on the tackbeat. At around 5 a.m., having hiked some 43 miles through the night, they take shelter in a ditch. They take turns sleeping and keeping watch. As the day wears on, it grows colder and begins to snow. After resting, Stan seems better. Chris's feet are beginning to grow blisters due to his rough wool socks. The three snuggle together in the muddy, snowy ditch until dark. At night, they set out, trying to navigate toward the border via compass. They walk for hours in the freezing cold. Vince gets belligerent and loses his grip on reality due to hypothermia. Eventually, he falls behind. Chris and Stan briefly retrace their steps, but they can't find him. Chris makes the difficult decision to press on, and Stan agrees. The patrol is now down to two. After walking for hours, near morning, Chris and Stan cuddle for warmth in a wadi and sip whiskey from Chris's flask. Thankfully, it's a sunny day and they're able to dry out some. Chris eats two biscuits at the last of his food. They've lost track of time, but they think it's Saturday, January 26th. Midday, they hear the jingling of bells. Goats. Along with the goats comes the threat of them being discovered again. Chris wants to ambush and kill the herder, but Stan doesn't want to kill a civilian. Against Chris's wishes, Stan steps out of their hiding places and tries to communicate with the herder. Unfortunately, the surprised herder doesn't speak English and they don't speak Arabic. Stan decides to go to the nearby village with the herder. Chris begs him not to go, but Stan's adamant. Chris tells him he'll wait until 6.30 p.m. for Stan to come back. As promised, Chris waits until dusk for Stan to return before checking his compass and walking north. He's walked for about 15 minutes when he sees the lights of an approaching SUV. Thinking that it's Stan, he runs toward the SUV, and that's when he notices a second set of headlights. Stan would never send two vehicles. Chris turns and runs from the SUVs, and that's when they begin to chase him across the desert. After Chris destroys the SUVs with his rocket launcher, he continues his trek toward Syria. Now out of water, he keeps thinking that he should reach the Euphrates River soon, but doesn't. Eventually, he sees a small village with crops. Surely, they're near the river. Chris stealthily skirts the village as the dogs start barking. At the river, he tries to fill his water bottle, but discovers that the water is shallow over a layer of silt, so he wades out further and ends up getting sucked down by quicksand. Luckily, Chris is able to struggle free. He carefully fills his water bottle, and the water is murky, foul-smelling, but it tastes good. Chris realizes he can't cross the river, it's cold, and the middle current is too strong and unpredictable. He has to go another way. Chris spends the next few nights hiking through the desert, occasionally zigzagging miles out of his way to avoid villages, vehicles, and goat herders. He sips a little whiskey when he needs a pick-me-up. With each step, his blistered feet grow more painful. During the days, he hides in the wadis or culverts and rests. Sometimes, he turns on his tack bee, but there's never any answer. He consults its map, but has trouble lining up landmarks with it. Chris crosses the MSR again and becomes demoralized by a highway sign, which announces that Al Qaim is 50 kilometers, which means that the Syrian border is 80 to 90 kilometers away. He thought he was much closer. The lack of water becomes an urgent problem again. Starting to get careless from exhaustion, Chris stumbles into a signal base, but manages to avoid the soldiers, at times crawling and shimmying across the ground. He finds a clear spring and fills his water bottles. 
Then Chris accidentally wanders into the large compound of a local politician. A huge portrait of Saddam Hussein is painted on one of the buildings. As the day approaches, Chris is deciding where to hide when he realizes that two men are headed in his direction. There's no way they won't see him when they pass. Despite his exhaustion, Chris's training takes over. He ambushes the men, stabbing one in the throat with his knife. He wrestles the other man to the ground and, using a judo hold, snaps his neck. He drags the bodies into the tall grass by the riverbank to hide them. Chris takes refuge in a stinky sewer culvert full of rotting trash and feces. He can barely maneuver his stiff fingers to open his water bottle. Finally, he gets it open and takes a sip. The water tastes metallic and seems to burn Chris's mouth. He spits it out and uses his flashlight and compass mirror to check his tongue. Everything looks okay. He tries a second mouthful of water with the same reaction. Clearly, the water's bad. Chris dumps it out. Very disappointed. It's been eight days since he had a proper meal and two days since he's run out of water. Chris's feet continuously ache, but he doesn't dare take his boots off because he doesn't know if he'll be able to get them back on. Furthermore, he's lost feeling in the tips of his fingers, and due to the dirt stuck under his fingernails, infection has set in. Chris dozes uncomfortably in the culvert, waiting for dark. At night, Chris is finally able to escape the compound area. He limps toward the town of Krabila but can't find it. Later, he'd learn that Krabila was blacked out due to war and he'd gone right past it. Eventually, Chris comes to a big barbed wire fence. Finally, is this the border? He manages to cross it with only minor injuries and staggers on. Suddenly, there's a blinding light and Chris wakes up sometime later. He drags himself to his feet and keeps going. He has several random blackouts. Chris sees a dwelling in the distance and makes for it. He turns on his tack bee. If need be, he'll kill someone for water. The goat herd family, although surprised and rather suspicious, helps Chris. He manages to ask where he is and they can confirm that he's in Syria. They give him water, sweet tea and flatbread, but he can't swallow it. For the first time in days, he takes off his boots. His feet are rotting, the toenails falling off. An older woman washes his feet. For a while, he's able to lay by a fire, warming his feet and letting them breathe. Through sounds and sign language, Chris communicates that he wants to go to the police. He gives the family a gold coin for their help. That actually makes things grow tense. They want more money and threaten him with an ancient rifle, but he mimes that he's out of money. The young man is aggressive about taking Chris to town, so Chris carefully eases his feet back into his boots, and he and the young man stand on the side of the MSR and hitch a ride. The camel farmer driver who picks them up speaks a little English. Chris lies to him, saying that he's a crashed airline pilot. Halfway through the ride, the driver kicks the young man out and sends him back home. Chris starts to worry. In the tiny town, they stop for gas. The farmer gets belligerent. Chris tries to bargain with him. The farmer whips up a crowd of people. Chased by a mob, Chris runs into a police station. The police take away his kit and open it. It's a tense moment when they find his 203 automatic rifle grenade launcher. Luckily, an official who speaks English shows up and asks for information. Chris provides his correct name and birth date, but lies about his regiment and repeats the crashed pilot story. Strip searched, blindfolded, and two wild car rides later, Chris ends up in Damascus. He's delivered to the head of the Mukhabarat, the Syrian secret police. The secret police allow him to finally get properly cleaned up. For the first time in several days, Chris sees himself in a mirror. He's gaunt. He's dropped from 176 to 140 pounds, losing 36 pounds in 10 days. Though the authorities provide him with a feast, he can't eat. He can only drink water. Per Chris's request, they take him to the British Embassy. He's questioned by Embassy Brass and writes down his whole story. They work out the route he took and chances are the spring he drank from was contaminated with nuclear effluent. After a few days of government red tape, Chris flies into a base in Cyprus. From there, he ends up in Riyadh, where he's interviewed multiple times by the brigadier and colonel in command of the special forces. The rest of Chris's patrol is still missing. No one knows what happened to them. The other patrols, Bravo 1 and Bravo 3, had declared their areas too dangerous upon arrival and had been extracted shortly thereafter. As it turns out, legs had been given the wrong radio frequencies and the base only received three garbled messages on January 24th. The army waited two days before mounting a search, which had to be aborted due to bad weather. Another search was mounted on the 27th with the focus on the most likely escape route, but they didn't find the patrol. A third search was also aborted, this time due to an ill pilot. On February 24th, the ground war launched and was over in five days. As it turns out, five members of Bravo 2, Stan, Dinger, Mark, and Andy were separately taken as POWs, ultimately ending up in the same prison. Eventually, they were handed over to the Red Crescent and released after the war. Legs died from hypothermia while trying to cross the Euphrates. Bob died after being caught in a firefight, and Vince died of exposure in the desert. 
The patrol originally broke into two because Andy heard a jet and stopped to use his tackbeat. Bob Legs, Mike, and Dinger had been behind Andy, so they stopped with him. After trying to contact the jet, the men saw movement ahead and thought it was an Iraqi patrol, so they stayed put until the patrol moved on, and by that time, Chris, Vince, and Stan had vanished. Chris physically recovered in about six weeks. The dentist had to remove some loose teeth, and Chris's gums had receded due to malnutrition. He also had a blood disorder from drinking dirty water and a high level of enzymes in his liver produced in reaction to the nuclear effluents. Thankfully, he didn't have radiation poisoning. It took Chris much longer to overcome the recurrent nightmares and psychological scars the mission caused. In all, he walked just under 200 miles in 10 days. You ever have a toothache? They can be very painful and distracting, an ongoing throbbing pain that just won't quit. And of course, deep down inside, you know that the only way to get rid of it is to visit a dentist, which means shots, drills, sharp pokes in your tender gums, toothaches are a real pain. But what if you had 526 toothaches? In July of this year, a 7-year-old boy in India complained to his mother of jaw pain, though initially it was ignored as it was minor. Eventually, though, his parents noticed swelling in his lower right jaw, and the boy complained of increased pain. Taking him to a dentist in the city of Chennai, doctors did a routine x-ray of his mouth to pinpoint the cause of the swelling and were shocked when the image finished processing. Right there in the boy's lower jaw was a large sac embedded directly into the bone itself. From what the x-ray showed, it looked like the sac was full of teeth to boot and of different sizes. The boy was immediately brought into surgery and placed under general anesthesia. Doctors then drilled into the jaw from the top, opting not to break the jawbone from the sides so that the boy would not need reconstructive surgery. Once they had drilled through the bone and accessed the sac, it was simply a matter of fishing out what the doctors described as basically a fleshy balloon. For up to five hours after the surgery, the doctors carefully sliced through the sac, extracting an incredible 526 teeth from inside of it. Ranging in size from 0.004 inches to 0.6 inches, each and every tooth was fully formed with a crown, root, and even enamel coat. While the boy will make a full recovery, he suffers from a condition called compound composite odontoma. Though in his case, what exactly caused the condition is not clear. Typically, genetics is to blame, but environmental factors such as pollution or radiation exposure in the womb or as a young child could also be to blame. In his case, his parents believe he may have had the teeth for quite a long time, as they first noticed him complaining of swelling and pain in his jaw when he was as young as three years old. Unfortunately, he would not sit still for doctors, and thus examining him at such a young age proved impossible. Odontomas, as it turns out, are benign and the most common tumors discovered on the human jaw. Typically, this condition is discovered during the first two decades of life and is as equally prevalent amongst boys as it is girls. Sometimes, as in our case today, they're only discovered when they cause swelling and intense pain. But most commonly, they're discovered when the presence prevents a normal tooth from erupting out of the gum line and into the mouth. Other times, they can be seen growing out of the gums and in the way of a normal healthy tooth, leaving an individual looking something like as if they had a shark's mouth with rows of tiny teeth. Surprisingly, people who suffer from compound odontomas often describe no pain at all, and it's only the eruption of many smaller teeth or their prevention of a normal tooth erupting that prompts discovery of the condition. While they pose no real health hazard on their own, other than impeding normal tooth growth, they can make tasks such as chewing very difficult if they prevent the eruption of full-sized teeth. If untreated though, a person could live a perfectly normal life other than occasional swelling and pain. What really makes our case today unique though is the fact that most compound odontomas don't have teeth as well developed, with the mass being a mix of dentin, cementum, and pulpal tissue all existing in a disorganized mess, sort of like someone took the ingredients for teeth and then tossed them about the room. Having the eruption of many fully formed teeth is rare, and having a whopping 526 of them is even rarer still. Despite posing little health risk, compound odontomas should still be treated in order to prevent the formation of dangerous cysts. They can also lead to great discomfort while eating, swelling, and naturally the prevention of normal tooth growth. Thus, dentists recommend that they be removed immediately. And if you happen to notice any persistent pain in your jaw, well, you may be playing host to a freakish amount of extra teeth. Also, dentist bills for the teeth we already have are expensive enough, so getting rid of them before they financially ruin your life is probably a good bet. Having more teeth than a shark would be pretty horrifying. 
But even more horrendous is a very rare condition often referred to as Treeman syndrome, known in the scientific world as epidermodysplasia verusiformis. This rare medical condition can leave a person with wart-like skin lesions that can grow completely out of control and leave the body looking like it's made of hard, gnarled wood. This condition is extremely rare and only a handful of confirmed cases have ever been documented by modern science. Caused by the human papillomavirus or HPV, the disease is brought on in very select individuals who have a genetic weakness to the disease that limits their body's ability to fight off the infection. This allows the virus to essentially take over the skin and cause lesions, which become extremely hard and take on a very wood-like appearance. HPV itself can be contracted through unsafe sex practices, but in at least one tragic case in Indonesia, the HPV infection and resulting tree man syndrome was brought on by a scraped knee at the age of 15. Of about 600 cases a year around the planet, most develop many flat warts, which quickly harden, though an unfortunate minority will see the large wood-like tumors develop, which can grow out of control. Typically, these sufferers will see wart-like lesions begin to grow uncontrollably across their body, though often the hands and feet are most severely affected. In time, the lesions become so numerous that new ones grow under the old ones, almost like new growth on a tree leaving rings behind. Within a matter of years, the condition can become so severe that individuals can carry as much as 15 pounds of growths. The hands and feet are rendered completely useless as the growths overtake the appendages, causing sufferers to be unable to work or provide for themselves. Surprisingly though, the skin under the growths is relatively unharmed, and surgeries can be performed to remove the growths and provide some relief from the condition. Unfortunately, the illness is untreatable, and though growths may slow down or speed back up randomly, some sufferers require as many as two surgeries a year to remove pounds and pounds of growths from their body. In 2017, a man living in Gaza had suffered from tree man syndrome for 10 years, and when he visited doctors in Jordan and Egypt, they recommended amputation, with Palestinian doctors telling him that there was no effective treatment. For a decade, Mahmoud Talouli had been unable to use his hands and was living in extreme daily pain. Then Palestinian and Israeli medical officials arranged for him to visit an Israeli hospital where he had the growths removed surgically, and in an experimental treatment had healthy, unaffected skin grafted from other parts of his body onto his hands. For the last two years, Talouli has returned to Israel for more surgeries, and though the condition is incurable, the treatments have allowed Talouli the use of his hands for the first time in 10 years. Yet, removing the growths was not easy, and required doctors to slice through the thick woody warts, and then deep into Talouli's flesh itself in order to remove the root. Without removing the root, the growths would simply return again. To make matters worse, by touching other lesions on his body and then touching the parts of his body where they had been removed, Talouli kept reinfecting himself. To seek a more permanent solution, Israeli doctors are now mapping Talouli's genome, hoping to pinpoint the genetic abnormality that leaves his body unable to fight off the HPV infection. If located, doctors would then be able to develop an immunological-based treatment specifically tailored for Talouli, which would eradicate the symptoms forever. This insight would also help other patients suffering from tree man syndrome, and could at last bring much-needed relief to dozens of people around the world who have been shunned and made into outcasts because of their monstrous appearance. One such man from Indonesia died in a hospital in 2017 after fighting the disease for decades, acquiring it after scraping his knee at 15 years old. Bark-like growths began to appear on his body, most notably on his hands and feet. Within years, his hands and feet were an unrecognizable mess of warts that made him look like tree roots and villagers feared that he had been cursed. The former carpenter struggled to continue working, but slowly the condition made it harder and harder to actually use tools until it became impossible. Though the social ostracization and fear of his condition and its possible supernatural origin also made it difficult to actually find work. Eventually, his wife left him, taking their kids with her due to his inability to find work and provide for the family. Even his family grew distant, fearful of catching his disease or also believing that it had been brought on by a curse. Despite hoping that a cure could be found, the Indonesian man died three months after being admitted to the hospital at age 42. At the end, he was unable to feed or care for himself due to the extreme growths and had largely resigned himself to his fate. Though the illness itself is not fatal, the condition had left him so weakened that he died due to several health complications including hepatitis and both liver and gastric disorders. Such extreme medical disorders are thankfully rare, but when they affect a victim can be completely debilitating. 
aging. Worse, some conditions such as the growths brought on by unchecked HPV infections can also lead to individuals becoming social pariahs, especially in less developed countries where superstition is prevalent. Next time you have a toothache or feel the flu coming on, thank the lucky stars that you're one of the millions whose body's self-defense mechanisms work properly and aren't forced to live with such extreme physical abnormalities. The rat-a-tat-tat of the drums lures people to follow the prisoner cart, slowly rolling through the streets of Sydney. Two condemned men are going to be executed this morning, thief James Hardwick and 23-year-old thief and murderer Joseph Samuel. By the time the cart reaches the gallows near Brickfield Hill, a large crowd is gathered. They don't yet know that they're about to witness something unusual and that the events of the day will long be remembered. Reverend Samuel Marsden administers last rites to Hardwick. An elder of the Jewish community, Joseph Marcus, who would later become Australia's first rabbi, performs rites for Samuel. Then the men are asked if they wish to confess. Samuel pleads his case, pointing out a man in the crowd, Isaac Simmons, as the real killer. Some people in the crowd are riled up after Samuel's impassioned speech, but the execution continues. At 10 a.m., Samuel and Hardwick step up onto the cart and have nooses placed around their necks. Here's where accounts differ. Some say that Hardwick received a last-minute pardon and Samuel was left to face his maker alone. Others claim that Hardwick was indeed executed and due to a bizarre twist of fate, he was the only one executed on this day. Either way, standing on the cart seconds from death, a terrified Samuel begins to quietly pray. The executioner slaps the horse's rump, the horse trots forward, and the cart pulls out from beneath Samuel's feet. In 1795, at age 15, Joseph Samuel was sentenced to seven years of imprisonment for larceny in England. In 1801, he was transported to Australia to serve out the remainder of his sentence. Samuel was imprisoned in the penal settlement at Sydney Cove in the colony of New South Wales. In addition to the harsh security of the prison camp, it was purposely miles from out of town. The guards figured that if a man was able to escape, the hostile outback would take care of him before he could make his way back to civilization. However, Samuel did escape and survive. Eventually, he made it to Sydney and took up with a gang of thieves. On the night of August 25, 1803, they robbed the home of a wealthy woman, Mrs. Mary Breeze. Among other items, they stole 24 guineas and several silver dollars. A constable on patrol in the area, Joseph Lucker, investigated. The next morning, Constable Lucker was found stabbed to death, becoming the first police officer killed in the line of duty in Australia. The gang of thieves was quickly hunted down and captured. Samuel had some of the stolen coins in his pocket when he was arrested. Also, Mrs. Breeze identified him as one of the culprits. When interrogated, Samuel confessed the robbery but claimed to have nothing to do with the murder. Still, he was tried and convicted. The other suspects were banished from the colonies or acquitted. Even though they were caught with blood on their clothes, two other suspects, Isaac Simmons and William Bladders, were acquitted due to insufficient evidence and their explanations. Simmons claimed that he was prone to nosebleeds and Bladder said he had recently slaughtered a pig. The morning of the execution, Simmons was escorted by police to watch the hanging, in the hopes that he would be frightened enough to confess. At the time in Australia, death by hanging was brutal. The more merciful drop hanging where a convict drops through a hole and their neck is quickly snapped hadn't yet been instituted. Instead, a condemned person stands on a cart. Once the noose is placed around their neck, the horse would pull away with the cart. Thus, the condemned would be left dangling and slowly strangle to death. As Samuels gets up on the cart, he's scared. His accusation of Isaac Simmons has angered some in the crowd but not stopped the proceedings as he'd hoped. Samuel prays as a noose is slid around his neck. The executioner slaps the horse's rump. The horse trots forward and the cart pulls out from beneath Samuel's feet. He painfully dangles for a moment, and then the rope around Samuel's neck inexplicably breaks, causing him to drop to the ground, spraining his ankle. Another rope is brought, and for a second time Samuel stands on the cart. Again a noose is placed around his neck. In this time, when the horse pulls the cart away, the noose unravels, extending the rope enough to allow Samuel's boots to touch the ground. By now, the crowd is uneasy. Not only has this man passionately proclaimed his innocence, but mysteriously, twice now, the executioner has failed to kill him. Some people shout for Samuels to be released, claiming that divine intervention is saving him. Nevertheless, a third rope is fetched. This time, the authorities quickly inspect the rope before making a noose. It's a standard rope made of five thick cords of hemp. It should be able to hold around a thousand pounds without breaking. For the third time, Samuel is placed on the cart a noose around his neck. The horse is slapped and pulls the cart away. Incredibly, the rope breaks again. 
Samuel falls face first into the ground and is briefly knocked unconscious. By now, the crowd is rowdy, they clamor for Samuel to be released. The provost marshal orders the execution to be delayed and gallops off on horseback to report the unbelievable series of events to Governor King. He comes back with a stay of execution. The governor has granted Samuel a reprieve. You would think that after his crazy brush with death, Samuel might straighten up and become a model citizen. But no, he didn't. Samuel was taken to the doctor for injuries received during the botched execution. He fully recovered. His sentence was converted to life in prison, and he was sent to Kingstown, which later became Newcastle, to work in the coal mines. In 1806, Samuel and seven other men escaped the settlement, sailing off in a boat during a storm. They were never heard from again. All were presumed lost at sea. Isaac Simmons was convicted and hung for the murder of Constable Lucker. However, today Constable Lucker's murder is considered to be Australia's oldest cold case with no definitive proof as to the murderer. You've taken up a job as a New York City window washer. Congratulations, it's an honorable profession. Sure, you can be performing death-defying feats of cleaning for a starting wage as little as 12 bucks an hour. But underappreciated as you are, you have a vital job, and you're more committed to maintaining transparency than most world governments. On your first day, you faced a daunting challenge cleaning the windows on the 47th floor of a New York City skyscraper. I hope you're not afraid of heights. But while you're busy with the thin Windex line between cleanliness and grime, disaster strikes. You'll lose your footing and tumble 472 feet to the unforgiving concrete below. You probably assume your next step is being scraped up and power washed into a gutter, but nope, you survived. You will live to wash windows another day. Seems far-fetched, right? But this actually happened to 37-year-old veteran New York window washer Alcides Moreno in 2017. We're going to tell you the incredible story of how he survived the seemingly unsurvivable today. First, let's talk about Moreno. He arrived from the US from Ecuador in the 1990s with his wife Rosario and his three children. This is a man who's truly committed to his job, and more than that, he downright loves it. When interviewed about his profession after his life-defining accident, he said, I love to see the windows really clean. I liked the water and the soap, how you press the squeegee. We'd start at the top and clean all the way to the bottom, and I loved it. It was with this intensely positive mindset that he and his younger brother, 30-year-old Edgar Moreno, took on the Solo Tower apartment block in Manhattan's Upper East Side. At 50 stories and 689 feet, it's a formidable structure, though still only the 71st tallest building in New York. The Moreno brothers took the elevator to the top floor with all their equipment. The roof was dizzyingly high. Even for those experienced window washers, the temperature was freezing, the air was thin, but this was nothing unusual for this line of work, so they just got on with it. Alcides and Edgar Moreno climbed into their 16-foot wide, 1,250-pound cleaning platform and prepared for another honest day's work. But this wasn't just any other day. A nightmarish disaster was about to strike. When the two brothers climbed onto the platform, forgetting to first put on and fasten their safety harnesses, the powerful cables that held the whole operation in place came dangerously loose. First, the cable on the left side, the side where Edgar Moreno was standing, came free, causing the entire platform to droop on one side and fling Edgar off the platform entirely. Sadly, this isn't the inspiring tale of how two brothers survived the terrifying situation. Edgar fell 472 feet, reaching speeds of around 120 miles per hour, before landing in a narrow alley. He landed on a wooden fence, severing his body in two and killing him instantly. Edgar's death is one of the 420,000 deaths that occur through falling every single year. It's one of the most common accidental ways to die. But Alcides didn't have time to think about this. His mind was more focused on his own seemingly imminent mortality. His side of the scaffolding came loose and began to hurtle down toward the ground like a screaming comet. However, unlike the tragic end of his brother, firefighters found Alcides alive in the hunk of twisted metal that was once the window washing platform, crouched down, fingers twisted in a death grip around the platform, having survived by virtue of not striking his head during the fall. According to witness reports, Alcides even attempted to stand. The first responders were amazed as they were baffled to find him alive, but Alcides was still in grave danger. He may have survived the fall, but it wasn't by much. While he was certainly luckier than Edgar, his injuries were nonetheless extensive and life-threatening. Alcides had suffered a traumatic head injury that left him with brain damage, as well as damage to his neck, spinal column, chest, and abdomen. He also had fractures to his right arm, ribs, and both legs. Alcides was practically on the edge of death. The firefighters slowly and gently 
handled him into the vehicle for a transport to a nearby hospital four blocks away. When Alcides arrived at the hospital, he was given extensive treatment for his injuries. He was put into an induced coma, and he had a catheter inserted into his brain to reduce dangerous swelling. The doctors cut open his abdomen in order to relieve the pressure on his organs. He was also transfused 24 pints of donated blood, which is around twice his entire blood volume. But the treatments didn't stop there. He was also given 19 pints of plasma, platelets, and a drug to stimulate blood clotting in order to reduce his life-threatening hemorrhaging. He was also given a tracheotomy surgery and a ventilator in his throat, as well as nine different orthopedic surgeries. Alcides' condition was so fragile throughout most of this process that the doctors couldn't even move him onto the operating theater. When later discussing the nature of Alcides' recovery, Dr. Herbert Pardes, who was president and CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital at the time, said, Said, if you're looking for a medical miracle, this certainly qualifies. And Dr. Pardis wasn't exaggerating there either. According to the chief surgeon of New York Presbyterian, Dr. Philip Barry, the death rate from falling three stories is around 50%. At 10 stories, the amount of people who survive are statistically insignificant. Alcides was a complete statistical outlier. Alcides Moreno remained in his medically induced coma for three weeks. He finally spoke on December 7th of 2007 to Rosario, who'd remained in his room and kept him company throughout the recovery process. Because of the head trauma Alcides experienced, he didn't even remember the accident happening. He did, however, deduce that his brother had died. Still, in spite of his brother's tragic death, Alcides Moreno was lucky enough to be alive after the whole ordeal. After a few more spinal surgeries and another surgery to help reconstruct his abdominal wall, he'd almost fully recovered. Naturally, the authorities looked into what might have caused the accident in the first place. The investigations into the circumstances of the incident found that the platform and cables hadn't been properly maintained over time, and the new motorized cables responsible for lowering the platform down the side of the building hadn't been properly anchored to the top of the building. It was a perfect recipe for the worst case scenario. Initially, the investigators also placed some of the responsibility for the accident on Alcides and Edgar, claiming that the fact that they weren't wearing their harnesses during the accident made them at least somewhat culpable for what happened. However, this line of reasoning was later dropped because the investigators couldn't prove that the brothers weren't just testing the platform before applying their harnesses and getting back on. Anyway, back to the story. The real question on everyone's mind right now is how Alcides Moreno survived falling 472 feet from the 47th floor of the Solo building. The answer is honestly still unclear. Many doctors and first responders believe that by all rights Alcides should be absolutely dead right now. But some possibilities can be found in science and in Moreno's basic window washer training. When asked about why he thought he was able to survive the ordeal, he credited the fact that he was trained to lay flat to the platform and cling onto it during his sudden descent toward the New York City streets below. The much larger surface area of the platform Alcides was clinging to likely offered air resistance that slowed the speed of his descent compared to his brother. Edgar's relatively small surface area had him fire down toward the earth like a bullet with little resistance. The physics of air resistance gave Alcides a fighting chance against the forces of gravity. Some speculated that perhaps the platform bounced against one of the surrounding buildings, slowing the fall, though this was never conclusively proved. The platform itself may have also acted as a kind of buffer between the force of the crash and Alcides' body, both dampening the overall force and distributing it evenly across his body. Edgar, on the other hand, took the full force of the fall himself on the razor edge of a fence, essentially assuring catastrophic physical damage. Alcides and Edgar essentially provide perfect examples of ideal and nightmare scenarios for falling from a great height without a parachute. We could look at a few similar examples to see if they provide any answers for how someone could survive such an insane fall. Joshua Hansen, a bar owner from Wisconsin, drunkenly crashed out of the window of a Minneapolis hotel's 17th floor. Hansen suffered a broken leg and a collapsed lung but walked away fine from the hospital a week later. This is still a miraculous feat of survival, but Alcides fell 30 floors more, so it's a little difficult to compare the two. Likewise, Tim Stillwell is thankfully still well after falling from the roof of his apartment building in 2013. His fall was broken by the roof of a nearby building, allowing him to survive with some broken bones. While having a more solid scientific answer would certainly be more satisfying than maintaining the mystery, the fact is the greatest factor in surviving any insane fall is pure luck. There's no one solid logical reason that Alcides Moreno was able to survive his 47-story fall, baffling everyone from scientists to doctors to first responders. 
Alcides and Rosario attribute a lot of his tremendous luck to the grace of God, owing to the fact that Alcides, in the words of Rosario, has never wished anything bad on anyone. In the aftermath of the incident, Edgar Morena was buried in the brother's home country of Ecuador. In the few years following, Alcides struggled greatly with survivor's guilt. He'd been close with his brother his whole life, the two of them having lived together in New Jersey and worked as a team since the early 90s. Alcides said, losing him was a big deal for me. I believe I felt melancholic for about three years. That's how long it took me to recover and accept his death. It was like losing a child because he was younger than me. While nothing could bring back Alcides' brother, he did at least achieve some financial justice for the company that caused his death. Rather than implicating Alcides and Edgar in their own tragedy, a Manhattan Supreme Court judge ruled in their favor, finding Tractel, the company responsible for installing the safety features on the window washing platform, liable for poorly installing the motorized cables. They also found that the Solo building was liable for its inadequate safety features. As a result, the two entities settled the matter with Alcides out of court for a large sum of money. Alcides Morena has since moved to Phoenix, Arizona and had a fourth child with Rosario. Morena said that the warm, dry air in Arizona is better for his bones, but he still misses the people of New York City. He no longer works for health reasons, but has maintained that he doesn't have a fear of heights because of the incident. Looking back on his experience, Alcides said, I have all the scars on my body, and because of the back injuries, I can't run, only walk. I'm not like I used to be, but thank God I can walk. That's amazing for me. And Alcides has put his life and ability to walk to good use. In the years since his accident, he supported his children in going to college and taking part in 5K runs for charity. While he said that life could never truly be the same, he's regained around 80% of the person he used to be. And for someone who fell to what seemed like certain death from the top of a 50-story building, 80% is honestly pretty darn good. It was July 9, 1958 and an earthquake on the Fairweather Fault in the Alaska Panhandle rattled for about one minute. It was the strongest in Alaska for 60 years, and it could be felt as far away as Seattle. The quake sent around 82 million tons of rock into the waters of Latuya Bay. All that rock hitting the water was like an asteroid impact, and the result was the world's tallest mega tsunami, measuring something like 1,720 feet. The giant mass of a wave continued down the bay, taking with it any vegetation on the mountainside. That monster destroyed everything in its path. One man and his son were sleeping in a boat in that bay as all this happened. Through the skin of their teeth, they survived, but others weren't so lucky. Howard Ulrich and his eight-year-old son named Sonny had been catching some Zs on their boat, the Edry, when the earthquake happened. They'd been out salmon fishing throughout the day and had retired to their bunks. Just after 10 p.m., their bunks started shaking, almost knocking the two guys to the floor. Howard had no idea what had happened, so he got up and went to the deck. The boat was still shaking violently from side to side. Suddenly, there was an eerie calm for about two and a half minutes, and what followed almost knocked Howard off his feet. He heard a crashing sound that was deafening, which was the rocks hitting the water in the bay. His son joined him on the deck. They both looked into the distance down the bay, and on each side they saw the mountain shuddering, sending snow flying high into the air. Suddenly, the two witnessed a wave coming toward them so large they could hardly believe their eyes. As the wave approached, though, it became smaller. Still, it was racing down the bay at about 120 miles per hour, taking out trees on the mountainside, plucking hundreds from their roots in a matter of seconds. Howard now knew that this was no time for standing around and admiring the power of nature. There was no way this wave was going to stop before it hit their small boat. Howard told Sonny to put on his life preserver and start praying to God Almighty. There was not much he could do to steer the boat out of the way since it was anchored, but he managed to turn on the engine and steer the boat so it was facing the oncoming wave. Had he not done that, the two might not have survived. Howard dropped the anchor as low as it could go, and his last words on the anchor were Mayday, Mayday, this is Idri in the Latuya Bay. All hell has busted loose in here. I think we've had it. Goodbye. The wave was now 1,720 feet when it was close enough for Howard to really see what was coming, but receded to just 100 feet high as it neared. When it finally reached them, the wave was only around 50 to 75 feet high, but that was enough to snap that anchor chain like it was nothing but a fishing line. The boat rose high into the air, riding the wave. With such force, Howard believed that the boat would be thrown to the land and smashed to pieces, but that didn't happen. Once they were over the crest of the wave, there was more danger, because the choppy waters were full of debris that the wave had taken with it. The two weren't out of trouble yet, and little did they know others were in danger too. Unfortunately, not everyone was as lucky as Howard and Sonny and managed to ride the mega tsunami. Some would succumb to the giant wave. 
There were two other boats in the bay on that historic day, a boat owned by Bill and V. Swanson named the Badger, and a boat named Sunmore owned by another couple Orville and Mickey Wagner. Both those couples were actually friends and prior to the incident had waved across the water and said hello. When Bill Swanson felt the swaying of the boat, he too got up to see what was happening. He later described what he saw next was like a big load of rocks spilling out of a dump truck. That might have been an understatement, because the rocks that hit the water would have weighed as much as 240 Empire State Buildings. The Swanson's boat was lifted even higher when it was hit by the wave. In Bill's own words, he said, We went away up over the trees and I looked down on the rocks as big as an ordinary house as we crossed the spit. We were away above them. It felt like we were in a tin can and somebody was shaking it. Looking down at the trees, Bill believed that he was at least 80 feet in the air when on the crest of the wave. That crest broke and the badger landed quite close to the shoreline. The boat soon began to sink and suddenly trees and other debris flooded it. Bill was hit in the chest and broke a couple of ribs, but both he and his wife didn't go under. The couple, still in their underwear, quickly got in their small dinghy. The water was rough and full of trees, but they managed to use that dinghy to steer out of danger. They were rescued by a fishing boat about two hours later. Referring to what he saw that evening right after the earthquake, Bill later said, People shake their head when I tell them I saw it that night. I can't help it if they don't believe me, but I know what I saw that night. On the opposite side of the bay, the Sunmore and its occupants Orville and Mickey Wagner were not so fortunate. Unlike the other two boats after the earthquake hit, the couple decided to get out of the bay. This might seem like a wise decision, but just as they turned out of the entrance, the wave hit them from the side. The boat flipped and was taken by the wave. The couple did not survive. It could have been a much bigger tragedy though, since two groups of campers consisting of 20 people should have been camping on the shoreline of the bay that evening. Lady Luck must have smiled on them because the two groups had decided for various reasons not to camp. Had they been there when that wave hit, they would have been taken by the waves along with the trees they were camping next to. Howard and Sonny didn't give up fishing, although a year after, Howard retired as a commercial fisherman. Bill and Vi soon recovered from their injuries, but Vi said she'd never get in a boat again. Bill did, and on May 26, 1962, almost four years after the accident, he returned to Latuya Bay in his boat to St. Nicholas. It was the first time he'd been back since the accident. This man, now a 50-year-old in good health, died of a massive heart attack just as soon as his boat passed through the entrance. Looks like the wave got him in the end. It's August 1819. You're 16 years old and you've just been hired as a deckhand on your first sea voyage. You're preparing for the adventure of your life, but little do you know that you and your crew will soon be stranded at sea, forced to eat each other to survive. The 87-foot-long, 240-ton whaling ship Essex is leaving today for a two-year, 10,000-mile journey to hunt sperm whales. You grew up on the island of Nantucket, the hub of the thriving whale oil trade, so you've always known you would go into the whaling business like everyone else in your life. As the ship pulls away from port, you stand on the deck and wave goodbye to your family. You can't believe that it'll be two years until you see them again, but at least you'll be a sea-tested sailor when you return. Only two days after setting sail, you get your first taste of the sea's wrath when a fierce storm comes out of nowhere and nearly sinks the ship. After making some repairs, you continue on your journey down the eastern coast of South America. And five weeks later, the Essex arrives in Cape Horn off the southern tip of South America. To you, it feels like you've sailed to the bottom of the world. Unfortunately, the delay from the storm means you arrived late and you find that the usually fertile hunting waters have been fished out. The captain decides to head toward the Galapagos Islands in the South Pacific in search of whales. After a long trip up the other side of South America, the crew anchors at Charles Island in the Galapagos to restock, where bad luck continues to plague your excursion. A reckless crew member's prank burns the entire island to the ground. You run through the flames and barely escape with your life. Thankfully, no one in the crew is hurt, but the same can't be said for the island's wildlife. You're now responsible for the extinction of the Floriana tortoise and the near extinction of the Floriana mockingbird. Finally, after more than a year at sea, your crew encounters a group of sperm whales. It looks like luck is finally in your favor, <laughs> or so you think. The experienced crew jumps into action, immediately launching three of the ship's 20-foot whaling boats crewed by six men each. Soon enough, two of the three whaling boats have successfully harpooned whales. No easy feat, since this involves rowing incredibly close to the whale so one man can harpoon it, then holding on for dear life while you try stabbing it to death with a lance. 
The third boat was not so lucky. It got too close to a whale and was damaged by the powerful beast. As the two successful boats are carried away by the panicking whales in what's called a Nantucket sleigh ride, the third crew returns to the ship, where you, as a lowly deckhand, had to stay during the hunt. As the first mate is angrily repairing his boat, you look out and spot the biggest sperm whale you've ever laid eyes on. It's a true monster, probably 85 feet long and weighing 80 tons. The whale is acting strange though. It's floating still in the sea, spraying water from its spout, and seems to be watching you. You shout out as it starts to swim directly toward the boat, traveling at a speed of around three knots. The first mate grabs a lance and takes careful aim, but hesitates, worried about angering the beast and it damaging the ship. You pray that it'll dive, but your prayers go unanswered. The giant whale smashes head first into the side of the ship so hard you're knocked off your feet. As water pours in through a hole in the port side and the crew scrambles to get pumps going, you can see that the whale is still there and it looks enraged, rolling in the water and snapping its jaws. Again, it turns and barrels toward the ship, traveling at six knots now as its 12-foot wide tail pumps furiously, leaving a 40-foot wake. The crew frantically tries to maneuver the ship out of the whale's path, but it's too late. The whale once again smashes into the ship head first, this time hitting the ship just below the anchor. The ship gets lodged on the beast's head as the whale pushes the ship sideways through the water and water pours over the transom. Finally, the whale disentangles itself from the wreckage and dives, disappearing for good, but the ship is destroyed. The crew scrambles to lower the last spare whaling boat and fill it with as much food, fresh water, and navigational equipment as possible. When the whaling boats notice that the Essex has disappeared, they immediately cut loose their valuable whales and head back to where they last saw the ship. The first whaling boat to arrive is one led by the captain. As he arrives on the scene to find his majestic ship floundering, the captain turns to the first mate and asks, My God, Mr. Chase, what's the matter? Mr. Chase, the first mate, can only reply, We've been stoved by a whale. You spend that night in the whaling boats tied to the wreckage, but by morning you all know that you need a plan. You're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, about as far from land as you can possibly be. You are 20 men and you have only three small whaling boats, and you only manage to save 60 days worth of provisions from the wreck. The crew quickly vetoes the captain's plan to head to the Society Islands a few hundred miles away, or to the Marquesas Islands 1500 miles away because they had heard rumors of cannibals living on those islands. The irony of this wouldn't be apparent until much later. Instead, it's decided that you'll head south, toward the South American mainland. You figure it'll take about 60 days to reach Chile or Peru, and at least you might be spotted by other whaling ships on the way. Each boat is loaded with 200 pounds of hardtack, a type of dried bread, 65 gallons of water, and one gun. Now that you have a plan and are headed towards land, you and the crew are in much higher spirits, believing the worst is behind you, but you have no idea what's in store for you. Within a few short days, those high spirits are broken. The human body needs a half a pint of water per day just to eliminate waste, and you've had less than half that amount. As you chew your hard bread and bemoan your parched throats, it dawns on you. All the food you managed to save has been soaked in seawater, and as the water evaporated it left behind salt, accelerating your dehydration. To add insult to injury, your boat is attacked again, this time by an aggressive killer whale. Thankfully, you escaped unscathed, but morale is low and getting lower by the minute. After 17 days at sea, a storm hits, gale-forced winds gust at 45 knots, lightning flashes all around you, and immense 40-foot-high waves toss the boat like toys. But by your 23rd day at sea, you begin to pray for a storm, when you find yourself stuck in a dead calm with no wind for days. The captain tries to rally a last-ditch effort and convinces you to row to freedom, but the effort is quickly abandoned as men start to collapse within minutes. You've traveled 1,100 miles, but you're still 5,000 miles from land. You are delirious with thirst, burned raw from the sun, and are rapidly running out of food. You're in an area of the Pacific with no marine life near the surface, so you can't even hope to catch fish. You reach Henderson Island two weeks later, but it's barren. Still, three men refuse to get back in the boats, and you leave them behind on the island when you resume your mission, assuming that they're dead men. Ironically, they would be rescued three months later and would end up being the lucky ones. One week later, the first man dies. He was ill before the shipwreck, so it was not unexpected, but it's still a blow to morale. 
The men tie a rock to his feet and slip the body overboard in traditional sea burial. Two nights later, the boat led by first mate Chase gets separated from the group. As the two remaining boats divide up what's left of the provisions, you realize that there is less than a pound of hardtack left to share between ten men. A few days later, when the second man dies, you all hesitate about giving him a burial at sea. No one wants to say what you're all thinking. Without food, you will all surely die, and the obvious solution is right there in front of you. You can hardly believe your eyes as you watch one of the most hardened crew members butcher the body of your fellow sailor. First he separates the limbs from the body, then all the flesh is cut from the bones. The heart is removed, and the body is sewn back up and committed to the sea as decently as possible under the circumstances. Finally, the meat and organs are roasted on a flat stone at the bottom of the boat, and you have the first taste of fresh meat in months. The average human body has about 60 pounds of edible meat, but your starving friend provided less than 30 pounds of very lean meat. Even still, once you've tasted fresh meat again, you can't seem to stop thinking about it. Satisfying your hunger seems to have reawoken it with a vengeance. After nine weeks adrift in the sea, the men in your boat realize that you would all die without food, and someone suggests you all draw lots to determine who will be eaten next. You know this is an old custom at sea, but you had hoped to never live to see it. The lot falls to young Owen Coffin and you begin to sweat. Owen is the captain's nephew. Surely he won't let him be eaten. And who better to take his place than you, the youngest and newest member of the crew? To your great relief, young Owen takes his fate heroically. One of his friends kills and butchers him, and you and the others feast again. Over the coming weeks, three more men would die and be eaten. After a miserable 89 days at sea, three men left clinging to life in First Mate Chase's boat spot a sail on the horizon. They muster the last of their energy and chase down an English ship, the Indian, and are finally miraculously rescued. The third boat will be found years later with three skeletons inside, among many other scattered bones that show signs of having been gnawed on. But your ordeal is not yet over. You and the captain are the last two men left alive and still 1,500 miles from Chile. When a ship pulls up alongside your boat, you're so delirious that you don't understand that these people are trying to help you. You're like a starved, feral dog, hoarding and protecting the last of the bones of your departed crewmates and trying to suck the marrow from them. As the ship makes its way to shore, you take time to rest and recover. Although you hear that the captain recovered rather quickly and has been dining in style with the captain of the ship and regaling him with stories of your adventure, you're reunited with the other three survivors in Valparaiso, and by the end of the summer, nearly two years since you left, you're all safely back in Nantucket. You know that cannibalism at sea is customary when men are faced with certain death, but it's still a relief to be welcomed back to your community without judgment. You do hear, though, that the captain wasn't so lucky his sister can't forgive him for eating his nephew, her son. Despite this harrowing ordeal, within a few years you and every one of the other four survivors will return to sea. And in 1851, a man named Herman Melville will publish a novel inspired by the story of the men of the Essex who were stranded at sea, forced to eat each other. It wasn't very popular at the time, but Moby Dick has gone down in literary history. November 22, 1963, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's open-top Lincoln Continental limousine drives through the streets of Dallas, Texas. Crowds are ecstatic, cheering, holding flags aloft and taking photos. Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas who's also in the car, turns around to the President and says, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Filled with joyousness, the President replies, no, you certainly can't. Moments later, as the car passes the Texas School Book Depository, shots ring out. The president's hands move toward his neck as he leans forward and a little to the left. His wife Jackie grabs hold of him. Another shot hits him in the head. Jackie, utterly distraught, cries, They've killed my husband. I have his brains in my hand. This was one of the most shocking events in U.S. history, and not without controversy. For many years after, right up until today in fact, various theories have been put forward as to how it actually happened and who exactly did it. However, one man, and one man only, was ever charged with the crime, and that was Lee Harvey Oswald. You've all heard the name. You've likely heard some of the countless conspiracy theories about the assassination, but we guess not so many of you know much about the man who is said to have pulled the trigger. Today you're going to meet him, and you're also going to ask yourself what would drive a 
person to do such a thing. That's something you can tell us at the end of the video. Lee Harvey Oswald is born on October 18, 1939. He doesn't have the best start in life since his father dies of a heart attack just two months into his life. The family, now the mother named Marguerite, young Lee, and his two half-brothers John and Robert are thrust into poverty. Those kids move around in the city of New Orleans, from orphanages to children's homes to boarding schools. Not having a father figure around young Oswald's development is what you might call strangled. As his older brothers once said, very early on he learned that he wasn't wanted. We weren't wanted. Mother was always alienating herself from us. When he's 12, Marguerite takes him to New York City, where they live in a rundown area in the Bronx. He's pretty much asked to take care of himself as his mother goes out to work. He hardly goes to school at all. Instead, he hangs around the zoo and rides the subway system. It's at the zoo where one day a truant officer sees him. Oswald is not happy about being found out, calling the officer a damned Yankee. He ends up in a detention center called the Youth House, and while there he has a psychiatric evaluation. He's said to live a vivid fantasy life and possibly has some kind of personality disorder. One thing's for sure, the kid desperately needs some love and attention. His social worker confirms this, saying he is emotionally frozen, having never really developed a relationship with anyone. You get the feeling of a kid nobody gave a darn about, says the social worker. In his early teens, he has an awakening. He's walking down the street when an old woman hands him a pamphlet. It's socialist in ethos and has in it two folks named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Those two are sentenced to death in the US for spying for Russia. Sometime later, Oswald writes in his diary, I was looking for a key to my environment, and then I discovered socialist literature. I had to dig for my books in the back dusty shelves of libraries. He writes this to the Socialist Party of America. I am 16 years of age and I would like more information about your youth league. I would like to know if there is a branch in my area area, how to join, etc. I am Marxist and have been studying socialist principles for well over 15 months. Later, after running from the clutches of truant officers, Oswald and his mother return to New Orleans. They live in an area beset with poverty and vice, something that affects young Oswald deeply. Drug addicts, prostitutes, violent crime, pervasive racism, dilapidated housing, oppressive cops, no help for the poor, and no opportunities for those not born with silver spoons. He's taking it all in, guided by his socialist sympathies. At age 16, he becomes a cadet with the Civil Air patrol. He also tries to join the army, but is turned down for being too young. This doesn't stop him from memorizing from back to front the Marine Manual. The obvious question is, why does this budding communist want to join the US military during a very cold war with the commies? This is a kid who tells a friend he wants to kill the President Eisenhower for exploiting the working class. This is a boy who regularly showers praise on the Russian leader Nikita Khrushchev. One day, a friend's father kicks him out of his house because he's expounding the communist doctrine and saying communism was the only way of life for a worker. It seems his reason is he just needs to get away from his mother. That, or it's the fact his father had been a Marine and his brother has joined up. The Warren Commission later wrote, his study of communist literature, which might appear to be inconsistent with his desire to join the Marines, could have been another manifestation of Oswald's rejection of his environment. You should also remember he's a boy who just wants to be accepted. So at age 17, he becomes a Marine. Nothing much changes though. He makes a few friends and not so many people like him. He isn't really seen as mentally unstable, but he just doesn't fit in. Nor does he ever rise above the rank of private first class. Still, he knows something about foreign affairs because he reads voraciously. At times, he picks fights with officers, according to one soldier, so he could come out top dog. This kid still hates authority with a vengeance, but he's also smart and can be likable to certain people. One day, he shocks some folks listening to his rants by saying, all the Marine Corps did was to teach you to kill, and after you got out of the Marines, you might be good gangsters. During this stint in the Marines, he has two court-martials. One for having an unauthorized pistol he accidentally shoots himself with, his other court-martial is for calling an officer out to fight him. He still holds sympathies towards the Soviet Union and he even teaches himself some Russian, albeit he's not very good. He gets taken off active duty to look after a sick mother, but then he decides he's going to go to Russia. For that decision, he's undesirably discharged. So there he is, in Russia, telling people how much he loves the Soviet Union in his rudimentary Russian. He tries to apply for citizenship and is turned down. This is what he writes in a letter to his brother. I've been a pro-communist for years, and yet I have never met a communist. Instead, I kept silent and observed. And what I observed plus my Marxist learning brought me here to the Soviet Union. I've always considered this country to be my own. He also writes this, In the event of war, I would kill any American who put a uniform on in defense of the American government. Any American. Just before his visa runs out and he's about to leave the country, he cuts himself on purpose, after which he's taken to a psychiatric facility. He actually can't believe that the country he's given his heart to has snubbed him. In his diary, he writes, I am shocked. He says his dream has been shattered because one solitary official has taken it upon himself to turn his visa down. He finishes an entry in his diary with these words, I decide to end it, soak fist in cold water to numb pain, then slash my left wrist, then plug wrist in a bathtub of hot water. Somewhere a violin plays as I watch my life whirl 
pull away. I think to myself, how easy to die, and a sweet death. When he gets out of the hospital, he goes straight to the American Embassy. He has a signed note with him, which he hands over to an official. On it are the words, I, Lee Harvey Oswald, do hereby request that my president's citizenship in the United States of America be revoked. He says he wants this for political reasons. He's a Marxist now, and damn American poverty and the life he lived as a kid. He says the only real reason he joined the Marines was that he wanted to have a chance to observe American imperialism. He writes in his diary, I'm sure Russians will accept me after this sign of my faith in them. He's right. He's allowed to stay. But does he then become a tool of the Soviet government? Is he hired as a spy? Is he trained as an assassin? Perhaps not. And later investigations will say that. Not only that, that the Russians are obviously a bit suspicious of him. So the KGB follow him around a lot and plant bugs in his house. Oswald is actually working for neither side. He's sent to work as a lathe operator at an electronics firm in Minsk. Over there he's given quite a good wage packet and lives in an apartment that's better than most people's places. Still, his distrust of authority doesn't change. He talks about the oppressive Soviets. Communist Party officials he writes are given benefits that he believes they shouldn't receive. His conclusion is that they are fat, stinking politicians over there just like we have over here. In January of 1961 he writes in his diary, I'm starting to reconsider my desire about staying. The work is drab, the money I get has nowhere to be spent, no nightclubs or bowling alleys, no places of recreation except the trade union dances. I've had enough. He subsequently gets in touch with the US Embassy and says he wants to come home. Prior to that happening, he has a whirlwind romance with a 19-year-old pharmacology student named Marina Prusakova. After six weeks, they marry, and around a year later, they have their first child. Not long after, the three of them land on American soil ready to live out the American dream. But something happens on Oswald's return. He suddenly becomes not himself, not the man Prusakova knows. He's become easily enraged, irritable, she later told the court. After coming to the United States, Lee changed. I did not know him as such a man in Russia. What has happened to him? Well, that's the million dollar question. Maybe his demons have caught up with him. This is a young man who's had psychological problems as a child. He's trained in the Marines and that hasn't helped. He's tried moving to the Soviet Union and that hasn't helped either. Here's a man that now detests both communism and capitalism. This is evident in this writing, of which one diary goes like this. No man having known, having lived under the Russian communist and American capitalist system could possibly make a choice between them. There is no choice. One offers oppression, the other poverty. He believes there can be another system, one which doesn't have the shortfalls of capitalism and one which isn't a corrupt and twisted form of Marxism. He writes that he hates the mass exterminations of Stalin and how communism oppresses people. He equally detests what he considers a corrupt form of capitalism in the US. He gets a job as a sheet metal worker, but he soon leaves that. He then starts working as a photo print trainee but is fired after wrangling one too many people when waxing about his beliefs. He isn't very good at the job either. But what really peeves his fellow employees is the fact that one day he brings to work a Russian language newspaper. His employer said the newspaper incident wasn't the only reason he was let go, but it didn't do him any good. Oswald is rejected once again. Is he now ready to put his hand on the trigger? In March 1963, he pays $29.95 for a secondhand 6.5mm Carcano rifle. He buys himself a revolver too. The next month, retired US Major General Edwin Walker is sitting at his desk in his home in Dallas when suddenly there's a loud crash. He's injured after bullet fragments connect with his arm. To investigators, it looks like an assassination attempt, and it is. One it will turn out that was undertaken by Lee Harvey Oswald. This isn't discovered until later, though. Why has he done it? Oswald despises Walker for his far right-wing sentiments, his anti-communist stance, and his racist attitude. According to his wife, he believes that if someone had killed Hitler in time, it would have saved many lives. He thought he was doing the right thing. The family moves to New Orleans, where Oswald becomes more infatuated with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. There, he distributes leaflets supporting Cuba, and even though he gets on the radio twice, he doesn't really garner that much attention for the movement. Not only that, Cuban exiles can't stand him. It seems Oswald is as much concerned about getting attention for himself as he is for the plight of Cuba. His wife later said in court he wanted to be arrested. I think he wanted to get into the newspapers so that he would be well known. He then tries to get to Cuba via Mexico. In Mexico, he pleads to the officials at the Cuban embassy saying he supports the cause and can he have a visa. He says he's also intending to return to the former Soviet Union. After speaking with officials and even the KGB, he's turned down. The Cubans say he'll do more harm than good for the cause. So now, it's just days before JFK is gunned down in the street. His heavily pregnant wife is happy when he returns from Mexico, seeing as he is in a pleasant mood and treats her well. He seems like his old self again. She said later in court, he helped me more, although he always did help, adding that he was delighted about the prospect of having a second child with her. Strange, because he's about to give it all up. It's this kind of fact that will later give birth to a thousand conspiracies. Around this time, Oswald's told about a job that's going at the Texas School Book Depository, and after an interview on October 16th, he's hired there for $1.25 an hour. It's now just over a month before the fateful day. He's apparently pretty good at 
loses his job, things are looking up, and then his second child is born. Life couldn't be any better, on paper anyway. He still argues with his wife at times. Because of his radical left activities, he's now on the radar of the FBI. Agents visit his house, but he isn't there. They go again and he isn't home. With feathers ruffled, Oswald goes to the FBI office in Dallas and asks to speak with the man on his case, James P. Hostie. Hostie isn't available, so Oswald leaves a note. That note, people later say, included a threat that said stop bothering me or I'll blow up the FBI and the Dallas Police Department. Hostie later said there was no such threat, and the note actually read, if you have anything you would like to learn about me, come talk to me directly. If you don't cease bothering my wife, I will take the appropriate action and report this to the proper authorities. Does that sound like the words of a soon-to-be killer? The night before the assassination, Oswald goes to bed before his wife. When she later retires, he says nothing to her, even though she's pretty sure he's awake. When she wakes in the morning, he's gone. His wedding ring is sitting inside a cup on the dresser. $170 is in a wallet in a drawer. He's only taken $13.87 with him, hardly enough to flee the country. The next day, after JFK is fatally injured, Oswald is seen in the second floor lunchroom by a cop who has a gun drawn on him. Oswald's supervisor is also there, so Oswald's allowed to walk on. He appears calm. Not long after, Oswald is apprehended after a short altercation in a movie theater. During questioning, he's forthcoming and seems composed. He denies all wrongdoing. He says he's a patsy, meaning he thinks he's being framed. The evidence against him is overwhelming. He's seen by multiple witnesses shooting and killing a policeman when walking down a street. When he's arrested in the movie theater, he says the words, well, it's all over now. But this isn't another JFK assassination story. It's a who was Lee Harvey Oswald story. So then why did he pull that trigger? It's not easy to ascertain the answer. Far from it. He was shot and killed two days later by a nightclub owner, Jack Ruby, while being escorted through Dallas police headquarters. Ruby himself was later treated by the CIA's brainwashing specialist, Louis Joylin West, and diagnosed with psychosis. That's a story to get conspiracy theorists excited. While behind bars, Ruby got in touch with the Warren Commission and said, I want to tell the truth, and I can't tell it here. Nothing came of it, and Ruby died not too long after losing his mind. Was anyone else involved in the assassination, from abroad or at home? We just don't know. Theories range from the spectacular to the heavily rejected Oswald, often insecure, having argued with his wife and just gone off the deep end. Maybe he just wanted to become the center of the world. Maybe he really thought he could help society, or perhaps, as many theories go, the Mafia was involved, the KGB was involved, the Soviets were involved, or the Cubans were involved. If you like rabbit holes, this is a deep one. Polls show that way more Americans believe he was part of some kind of conspiracy rather than acting alone. Was he an insecure guy that managed to shock the world without any help, or was he a pawn in a much bigger game? You ever had that nightmare where you're naked and everyone's laughing at you? Well, for mountain man John Coulter, the bad dream was real. The hot summer sun beat down on his unmentionable places as a crowd of Blackfoot Indians made crude gestures and taunted him. They had already killed his partner, and now a group of leaders were deciding his fate. Suddenly, an elder grabbed Coulter's arm and led him away. Go, said the elder, pointing at the prairie. Run! Confused, Coulter staggered forward and then glanced back. The Blackfoot warriors were stretching, limbering up. That's when Coulter realized he was running for his life. Late in the summer of 1809, John Coulter and John Potts left Fort Raymond, also known as Fort Manuel, and ventured into Blackfoot territory near where the Gallatin, Jefferson, and Madison Rivers meet. Today, this area is known as Three Forks, Montana. The two men were skilled hunters and planned to trap beavers. They had met a few years before when they had been members of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Coulter and Potts knew that poaching in Blackfoot territory was extremely dangerous, but a good price was being paid for beaver pelts, so they tried to keep their presence on the down low. They set out beaver traps at night, checked them in the early morning, <laughs> hid and slept during midday. The two men were each paddling a small dugout canoe up the Jefferson River when they heard a stamping noise. Coulter worried that it was Blackfoot Indians and wanted to turn back, but Potts insisted the noise was buffalo and accused Coulter of cowardice. For the rest of Potts's very very short, miserable life, he wished he had listened to Coulter. They paddled around a bend to see that the banks of the river were lined with around 800 Blackfoot, some on horses. The tribe gestured for them to come ashore. Coulter thought it was best to comply. Trying to escape was futile. He furiously cut the lines for his beaver trapping gear, letting it drift to the shallow bottom of the river. He told Potts that he could retrieve it later. Coulter went ashore. He spoke rudimentary Blackfoot and also a little crow, the language of the neighboring Indian tribe. He thought that he and Potts were just going to be robbed. The Blackfoot took Coulter's gear, his rifle, flint, powder horn, and his knife. Then they made him strip. Off came Coulter's shirt, belt, 
pants and boots. Soon he was as naked as the day he was born. Meanwhile, Potts stood in his canoe, long rifle in hand, watching the proceedings and refusing to come ashore. The Blackfoot communicated to Coulter that he should tell Potts to come ashore. Coulter told Potts, but Potts refused, saying that he might as well lose his life rather than be stripped and robbed like Coulter. Prophetic words. An archer on the shore shot Potts in the hip with an arrow. Potts fell to the bottom of his boat. Coulter asked if he was hurt. Potts said, yes, he was hurt, too injured to escape. As he rose up from the bottom of his canoe, poised for action, Potts told Coulter to get away if he could. He was going to shoot at least one Indian. Potts fired, killing one Blackfoot. All hell broke loose. A volley of arrows were unleashed at Potts and in seconds he was dead, riddled with arrows and bullets. Blackfoot jumped in the river and dragged Potts' boat to shore. Raging, they tossed his corpse on the ground. They mutilated his body, hacking it apart with tomahawks and knives. Coulter stood by, head turned away so he didn't see. Some accounts claim that the Blackfoot threw Potts' entrails into Coulter's face to goad him. Either way, soon all that was left of Potts was a bloody, pulpy mess on the ground. An angry warrior came at Coulter with a tomahawk, but his tribesmen grabbed him and held him back. A group of leaders and elders quickly convened to decide what to do with Coulter. Meanwhile, Coulter stood there in his birthday suit, being harassed by the mob. He was sweating, trying to keep a cool head while dreading what was going to happen next. Would the Blackfoot torture him before they killed him? An elder left the council, came over to Coulter, grabbed his arm, and began to walk him away from the crowd. The elder pointed at the prairie. Go! Go away, he told Coulter and Crow. Coulter walked a few steps forward on shaky legs. He thought that the tribe was going to shoot him in the back. The elder impatiently gestured and demanded Coulter go faster. Coulter walked a little faster. When he got maybe 100 yards away, he glanced back to see that the young men of the tribe were stripping off their leggings and stretching. That's when Coulter understood. They were the hunters, and he was the prey. He was running for his life. His heart pounding, Coulter took off, running as fast as he could. Seconds later, blood-curdling cries went up as the Blackfoot came chasing after Coulter. Coulter was fleet afoot, he was in good shape, and adrenaline coursed through his body. But every step was painful. The prairie was treacherous. Large swaths of prickly pear bush covered the ground. The tiny spikes from their stickers pierced the tender skin between Coulter's toes. Pebbles tripped him and also bit into his feet. Shrubs scratched and left welts on his calves as he charged through them. Thankfully, Coulter knew the area. He was about five miles from the Madison River. If he could just make it there. Coulter ran and ran, not daring to look back. Startled birds flew up from the grass as he bolted past. He could hear war whoops and laughter carrying on the breeze. Also, footsteps. He wasn't sure if the Blackfoot were close on his tail or if it was just the imagination of his terrified mind. Finally, Coulter couldn't bear it any longer. He was out of breath. He had a stitch in his side. His nose had started to bleed from the extreme exertion. Slowing down, he looked back. Coulter had run perhaps three miles. Most of the hunters had lost steam and were distant specks on the prairie. However, one graceful runner draped in a blanket and carrying a spear was far ahead of the rest of the pack, maybe around a hundred yards behind Coulter. The distance between them was just shy of an American football field. Coulter took off again. The Blackfoot hunter chased him for another mile, slowly gaining ground, getting closer and closer. Heart racing, lungs burning, ears ringing, Coulter could run no more. He stopped and whirled around, arms spread wide, panting, his feet shredded and his nose gushing blood. Coulter pleaded for his life in Crow. The exhausted warrior didn't hear Coulter or didn't care. He ran closer and then lunged at Coulter with his spear, but stumbled and fell, breaking his spear in two. The tables were turned. Suddenly, it was the Blackfoot warrior on the ground begging for mercy. Coulter snatched up the half of the spear that had the sharp head and impaled the warrior, pinning him to the ground. Coulter worked the broken spear free of the dying man and stole his blanket. Buoyed by a fresh wave of energy, Coulter turned and ran for the river, which was about a mile away. Coulter gained a little extra time as the Blackfoot stopped to check on their fallen tribesmen. The discovery of their comrade's death sent the Indians into new paroxysms of rage and grief. At the bank of the Madison River, Coulter paused to catch his breath and scan the area. Slightly downstream, he noticed a huge beaver lodge with a mound of brush, sticks, and river debris rising from the water. Coulter plunged into the river, and golly, it was cold. The water came from snowpack melting further upstream. At least it numbed his swollen, bloody feet. Coulter swam to the beaver lodge and dived down to come up onto the wall and enter it. Beaver are clever animals, good at construction. Their lodges are often multi-roomed and two-story. The interior made watertight by an intricate weave of twigs, grass, and mud. 
Coulter secreted himself on the dry second level of the ledge. Just in time, the Blackfoot splashed into the river. Searching for Coulter, they stood atop the beaver mound, poked spears into it, and argued about which way Coulter went. Coulter lay inches under them, scarcely breathing, worried that the hunters would fall through or set his hiding place on fire. Thankfully, they didn't. Instead, the Blackfoot spread out to comb the area. Several men crossed to the opposite bank to look for him on the other side of the river. Coulter stayed in his hiding place, terrified that they had left someone on watch. The main pack of hunters came back two hours later, angry, having not seen hide nor hair of Coulter on the far side of the river. Finally, the Blackfoot left, returning to their tribe. A shivering Coulter decided to play it safe and stayed put until dark. Then he finally left the beaver lodge and swam many miles downstream. Finally, Coulter emerged from the water, chilled to the bone. All he had was the sharp end of a broken spear and a sodden blanket. No food, no clothing, and no gear. He was hundreds of miles from the nearest fort. Worse yet, an angry Blackfoot tribe was probably monitoring the nearby mountain pass. Sure, going through Bozeman Pass and following the Yellowstone River was the quickest route back to Fort Raymond. However, that route would take Coulter through the heart of Blackfoot country. He didn't want to chance it. Coulter took a long detour which added probably 100 miles to his journey, but it was far safer. Coulter walked about 30 miles east toward the Bridger Mountains. To get over the mountain, he climbed a near vertical peak. Hiking through the snow-capped peaks at the top of the mountains was especially hard, as he had only his alone blanket to stay warm. Once over the mountains, Coulter walked across the Great Plains and then through the Montana wilderness. He ate berries, bark, and roots known as prairie turnips, dug up with his hands and the spear point. Eleven days and some 300 miles later, Coulter finally arrived back to Fort Raymond. He was naked, sunburned, covered in insect bites, and emaciated. His feet were swollen and blistered, his eyes were glassy and his beard long and scraggly. Close companions didn't even recognize him. Coulter spent several weeks recuperating from his narrow escape and arduous journey home. Later that winter, Coulter, who was brave, foolish, or insane, or perhaps a bit of all three, headed back into Blackfoot territory. He wanted to retrieve his expensive beaver trapping gear which he had dropped into the river on that terrible summer's day he ended up being hunted. Since it was the dead of winter, Coulter figured he'd be okay. He thought that the Blackfoot would be hunkered down in their camps until spring. Coulter traveled through the Bozeman Pass and reached the Gallatin River. One evening, he was settling down to a nice meal of boiled buffalo meat by his small campfire when his sharp hunter ears detected the telltale sound of twig snapping. Operating on instinct honed from years of living in the wilderness, Coulter dove down atop his fire, extinguishing it. Muskets cracked and musket balls whined over Coulter's head as he lay in the darkness. Finally, Coulter had enough. He hastily packed up and went back to Fort Raymond, eventually heading east to buy a farm, settle down, and get married. November 18, 1978, an employee at Burger Chef swings by the restaurant to say hi to his workmates as they finish their evening shift. He opens the door to find the restaurant is empty. The lights are on and things don't look that out of the ordinary for just after closing time. But he doesn't see any of the four staff that should be working. Those are three teenagers and the 20-year-old assistant manager. It's eerily quiet, so he shouts out, Hey guys, what's up? No answer, so he shouts again, now becoming a little bit nervous as he peers at burger cartons that should have been cleaned up. Hey guys, stop messing around! There's still no answer. They aren't in the back either, nor are they in the office or the bathroom. They've gone. Just vanished. The guy calls the cops even though he's sure they'll turn up nearby or something. They will turn up, and what ensues will haunt that young man for the rest of his days. This case will become one of the most confounding crime mysteries the USA has ever seen. A story with so many twists and turns it'll make you dizzy trying to guess what happened that night. It wouldn't be out of place in a season of Breaking Bad. In fact, as you'll see close to the end, Breaking Bad could easily have been partly based on the murders. Not long after the discovery of the empty restaurant, Indiana State Trooper Jim Cramer got a call on his radio. This night will become his worst nightmare, something he'll take with him well past retirement. The town of Speedway, Indianapolis, population 12,500, will soon become one of the most talked about places in the USA. Dispatch informs Kramer that a bunch of kids have just gone missing from the Burger Chef restaurant. Their assistant manager Jane Fright, 20, and workers Ruth Shelton, 17, Danny Davis, 16, Mark Flemons, 16. Kramer might not have worked on too many big cases, but one thing he's used to are bored local kids messing around. Still, when he gets to the restaurant, he's met with the scene of a crime. The safe is open, and money bags are strewn around. Lying near the safe is some adhesive tape that's been used up. Okay, he thinks there's been a robbery. 
That's not so unusual, but what is unusual is the fact that the four staff are missing. With holdups, people might get hurt from time to time, but they'll almost always be found on the property. Kramer thinks that in all likelihood they might have been forced out of the restaurant and taken someplace. They'll turn up sooner or later, he imagines. More cops arrive at the scene, as does the burger chef manager. He informs the police that only $581 has been stolen, not a lot of cash even back in 1978. It seems obvious, say the cops. The kids took the money and have gone on the spending spree. Maybe they took the loot and hit the road, probably after having a beef with the manager. But then one cop starts shaking his head. He's seen enough TV to know something's amiss. If that's the case, he says, why are the bags and purses here? Surely they would have taken them with them. The older cop laughs in a derisive manner. One of them says, OK, Colombo, maybe it was the butler that did it with the ice cream scoop in the toilet. They're pretty sure it's a case of dumb kids who didn't exactly think through their crime. They're so sure that's the case, they don't even tell the restaurant not to open the next day. The next morning, staff will clean up what's actually a major crime scene. As you'll see, this will have profound ramifications. The young cop was right. The kids don't turn up at all. They don't call their parents or friends, they haven't been seen anywhere. Two days later, a couple's out hiking in a quiet lane alongside some woods. They see tire tracks, except it looks as if someone was in a hurry and skidded off the lane. They follow the tracks and head off into the woods. The spot's about a half hour drive from Burger Chef restaurant. First, they find the bodies of Ruth and Danny. They're face down and have been shot execution style in the back of the head multiple times. They've also been beaten around the face. The woman puts her hand to her mouth in shock. The man looks around, wondering if the killer might still be in the woods. It's then he sees something he'll never forget. He says nothing to his wife and just walks toward another body. It's the assistant manager, Jane. She's been stabbed twice through the heart. Whoever did it used so much force the blade broke off in her chest. The third victim, Mark, is a bit further away near a creek. He's been beaten so badly he barely looks human. His face is a bloody pulp. It'll turn out that the cause of death was him choking on his own blood. What he was hit with is still a mystery, although a large chain will become a suspected weapon. This is not only an astonishingly brutal crime, but one that's unusual even in a country well known for its regularity of violent crime. But it seems like a needless crime. Why on earth would someone have done that? They already had the cash. Ok, so they might have been seen, but even so, a quadruple murder? Also, given the fact that the murders were so violent, one might assume the killer had known the youngsters. This looked like a revenge crime. It just didn't make sense though. The victims didn't have all the same friends and they didn't have any known enemies. They were still kids, not arch criminals. At one of the girls' funerals, the minister, close to tears himself, looked over at the grieving family. Gritting his teeth, he said, Somewhere in this city, this state, this country, there's a man or men who are the executioners of the four precious lives. Sooner or later, they will be caught and judged. Why or oh why would anyone have done that to them? Watch on, because this story is gonna get wild. The cops came under a lot of scrutiny, of course. This was the biggest story of the year. People had just gotten used to the fact that Ted Bundy was no longer prowling the streets, and now they look at their TVs and hear how four innocent young kids have been viciously killed. Maybe it was a serial killer. It was the 70s, the so-called golden age of serial killing. Still, this crime didn't have the same MO as a serial killer crime. The place was robbed, which is not usually in the bag of tricks that deranged serial killers take to the scene of crimes. Not only that, none of the victims had been messed with sexually. Plus, they'd been killed in different ways, so the murders had separate signatures. Ok, so let's have a look at what could have happened. Firstly, there were two teenagers that said they saw something strange that night. They said they had spotted two men looking rather suspicious parked outside Burger Chef sometime before midnight. It was closed, so they did wonder why someone would wait outside. They went over to the car to investigate, whereupon the guys got out. They demanded to see the kids' IDs, acting like they were cops. Once they'd seen the IDs, the men said, get away from here. There's been a lot of vandalism in the area. They might get picked up. The kids said both guys were white in their 30s. One of them had a beard and the other guy was pale in complexion and had light-colored hair. The cops even had the kids hypnotized, thinking an expert might help better jog their memories. With that information, surely something would happen. Given the extreme nature of the crime, you'd think the perpetrators would have had a history of violence. So just go through the data and look at local men, or at least men in the state who fit the profile. Well, the police did that. They actually brought a guy in for questioning. He'd had a beard at least five years, but guess what? He shaved it off the night before he was brought into the station to stand in a lineup. The kid who'd seen the men didn't pick him out. The guy had been brought to the attention of the cops because of another man. He'd been in a bar one night and had a few too many drinks. While playing pool, the suspect turned around to a bunch of other guys and said he committed the murders. 
The next day, someone got in touch with the cops. Mm -hmm. He was brought in for questioning and had to take a polygraph. He passed it, and after a lengthy interrogation, he was no longer a suspect. Thing was though, let's just say this guy wasn't exactly an angel. He had a bunch of dodgy acquaintances and he told the cops who he thought might have committed the crime. As well as the guy with the shaved off beard, he also told them about a fair haired guy who was likely the other killer. But guess what, when cops looked for him, they discovered he was in prison when the murders happened. The police had nothing, but this story is just getting started. We looked at Indianapolis Star news clippings from a few years after the crime, and it seems the cops thought they had their man in the mid-80s. You see, one day they got a call from an inmate serving time at Pendleton Correctional Facility. The man's name was Donald Forrester. He told the cops right out that he'd committed the murders. Sometime later, he went with the police to where the bodies were buried. He told them where he dumped each one and told them about the broken knife, something he shouldn't have known because it wasn't made public. The guy had been in and out of prison most of his adult life. He was serving a 95-year sentence for abduction and rape when he got in touch with the police. He'd also abducted a woman prior to being sentenced. She escaped from him, jumping out of his moving vehicle. She told the police she was so sure he was going to kill her. This was a bad man, perhaps capable of killing four innocent people. This is how Forrester described the night of the crime. He said the brother of the assistant manager owed him and two others money from a drug deal. They went to the restaurant to get the cash from his sister, but she refused to give him anything. A fight broke out when one of the male staff tried to protect her. In the melee, one of the teens fell and hit his head. Forrester said they thought he was dead, and that's why they executed everyone. They'd driven out to the woods, taking Demerol for some courage, while all the time the four victims were begging for their lives. It sounds like something from a movie, and we hate to say it, but it's possible the guy was making all this up. 95 years is a long time, maybe he wanted to mess with the investigation, or maybe he thought he could get some years off his sentence. Still, when the cops spoke to the man's wife, she told them he'd driven out to near where those killings happened to collect firearm shell casings. She said later he flushed them down a toilet. So the cops went to the house and looked at the septic tank there. Guess what they found? Shell casings. Cops interrogated Forrester numerous times, but then one day he refused to talk, saying only that he'd lied to them and he hadn't committed the murders. He said he could help them though. He asked them for immunity from the crime in return for help. He got it, but still no arrests were made after all the supposed help the police received. The last newspaper clipping we could find read, The immunity granted by Marion County Prosecutor may be voided if it's shown he did participate in the killings. Why couldn't the police charge the guy? Well, they just didn't have enough evidence. Even with modern DNA technology, they couldn't make anything stick. Plus, the knife handle was missing, the gun was missing, and the restaurant had a good rub down by those hardworking employees. Police did test DNA many times and nothing led back to Forrester. Still, how did he know things that the cops had never made public? What about those bullet casings? And you should also know that his cousin, who was his accomplice in the abduction crime, lived directly opposite Burger Chef. It totally looked like he did it, but watch on because you might soon change your mind. For many more years, investigators looked high and low. If they'd been looking for a needle in a haystack, they'd have put every last piece of straw under the microscope. Some locals forgot about the killings, but others, amateur sleuths themselves, never forgot. Word on the street said the cops knew exactly who'd done it. Years later, Kramer, now retired, bald, wearing a white beard, said he was obsessed with that crime. Even now, he has a lot of names in his head, a lot of questions that need to be answered. One thing he is sure of is that the investigation was botched from the start. He said it's known that because the cops didn't take photos of the restaurant on the night of the murders, they staged the scene the day after. They were so sure that night that the kids were okay, they just didn't do anything. Kramer knows this case better than anyone. He says while a lot of names have been thrown around, the beard shaver, the pool player, the woman abductor, it's more complicated than it seems. It's too easy to name people that look or looked guilty, he said. In a recent interview, he also said, I was in the dark. I'm still in the dark. And there are more twists to this tale. As we said at the start, there's a Breaking Bad element to the story. We will now ask you to recall a fictional fast food restaurant called Los Pollos Hermanos. This is the place the character Gus manages at the same time as running a mega meth lab. Well, police in this real case actually had evidence that a large drug ring was being managed out of that burger chef. It was investigated, but apparently just before the murders, that ring stopped operating there. It gets even stranger when you hear the dead assistant manager's brother was in fact later imprisoned for selling cocaine. While serving that sentence, he had a run-in with another prisoner. His name was Alan Pruitt. He walked up to the brother one day and said with a wry smile on his face, sorry about your sister. He said it in a way that suggested he knew a lot about those murders. A prison counselor that was close by said it seemed like a taunt. That counselor got in touch with the cops and the cops in turn contacted Pruitt. 
This was a few years after the murder. Pruitt told the investigators that he had seen what happened at the restaurant that night. Two men abducted the four youngsters and took them away in an orange van and the assistant manager's white car. He said the men were called Tim Willoughby and Jeff Reed. He also said at first he didn't think anything of it because he just thought they were all going out on the town. But then he saw something that made him change his mind. One of the older guys bashed one of the male teens' heads into the side of the van. He also said this, sometime after the night of the murders, he was playing frisbee close to a Dairy Queen restaurant when he saw that orange van again. Two guys in the van drove up to him and said, do you want to come for a smoke and a drive? They meant a smoke of weed, of course. This now gets really messed up because he didn't only take them up on the offer, but when he got inside the back of the van, the guys, plus the very stoned girlfriend of Willoughby, all started asking about what he saw that night. As this was happening, the girl named Marianne Higginbotham, out of her mind, started muttering about the murders of the staff at the Burger Chef. She also said the two guys in the front did it and they'd kill her if she breathed a word of it to anyone. Pruitt, understanding the gravity of the situation, told the guys he hadn't actually seen them that night. The four of them then drove down a quiet lane nicknamed the Devil's Backbone. They stopped the van and everyone got out. The girl stood next to Pruitt and whispered to him, run, they're going to kill you. He shot off like a gazelle, freed from lion's claws. Behind them he heard a gunshot, but then he jumped into a creek and swam away. When Kramer was listening to this, his impression was that Pruitt was telling the truth. As if this story couldn't get any darker. Willoughby later disappeared off the face of the earth. He has since been presumed dead, but his body has never been found. As for his girlfriend, the one who helped Pruitt, she was found dead, stuffed inside a barrel in 1979. Okay, so if that is the truth, case solved, surely. You should already know this story takes a lot of turns, and it turned out that Pruitt would change his story over the years when talking to Kramer and documentary filmmakers. In one of his last statements, he'd said he definitely saw the van, but he said he didn't see any of the victims. He also said he'd made up that trip out to Devil's Backbone. But why would he do that? Well, he said the cops harassed him and kept harassing him in regard to the crime. In his own words, he said, They just started bugging me and hounding me and pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. I just got to the point I finally started telling them anything they wanted to hear. If I knew who killed them kids, don't think for a split second that I wouldn't rat him out. Then, guess what happened? That guy with the 95-year prison sentence called the cops again. For the second time, he'd said he'd committed the murders. Kramer went to the prison to talk to him, and he wasn't impressed. He said the guy confessed all right, same story, drugs, a heroic burger maker, teens begging for their lives, but Kramer said it was obvious Forrester was lying. And listen to this, even though the guy might have looked guilty, a series of letters he wrote from prison seemed to contradict it. In one letter, he got mad at a relative for telling the cops he likely did it. And in another letter, he thanked the prosecutor for putting him behind bars, telling him that if he hadn't been locked up, it's likely one day he would have killed somebody. In fact, the guy's story didn't add up at all. One of his supposed accomplices that night couldn't have been with him because he was in prison on the night of the murders. The newspapers published his confession and much of the public believed it was him, but the police and the prosecutors understood the evidence and it looked like the guy was a chronic liar. One of the last things Forrester said to Kramer was this, if you send me back to prison you'll never solve this. Maybe he thought by helping the cops he could get released early and that's why he lied. That's what Kramer thinks anyway. We won't ever know because Forrester died in prison in 2006. We now have one question for you to answer. Just close your eyes for a few seconds and imagine young Jane, along with Ruth, Danny, and Mark, finishing up work that night. It's not far from midnight and the streets are quiet. What happens next? You've seen the movie Castaway, and obviously now you're a bit of an expert on how to survive on a deserted island in the middle of the ocean. You first do some recon to see if anyone else is on the island and if there's anything to eat, like bananas conveniently dangling from trees or any wandering animals. Nothing. It seems you'll have to fashion a spear so that you might do some shallow water fishing. Well, that turns out to be more difficult than you thought. At least you managed to collect some rainwater after a shower, using a large leaf as a receptacle. You're also well aware that if you don't find something head-shaped and proceed to draw eyes on it in a nose, you might lose your mind. You call him Rocky, or if it's a girl, you might call her Coco or Shelly. In reality, your chances of surviving on an uninhabited island for a long time are slim. If you got washed up without any tools, you might find yourself in a bit of a pickle. Even if you did find the most important thing, drinkable water, you're still going to have to build the shelter, make a tool for hunting, and actually be able to hunt. Indeed, if there is anything available to kill. But some people have survived, and now we will introduce you to one Captain Thomas Musgrave, a man whose story is nothing short of amazing. 
He was born in England in 1832, but at the young age of 16 he set out to sail the seas for the first time. He made a career out of this, but when his ship, the Grafton, left Australia on the 12th of November 1863 to go out and search for mining and sealing opportunities, his life would change forever. A crew of just five first headed off to Campbell Island, which is part of New Zealand's sub-Antarctic islands. Quite frankly, it's in the middle of nowhere, but on that island it was believed that there would be tin to mine, and so off the guys went. They had a backup plan too, because if tin wasn't found, they could at least do a bit of seal hunting and on their return sell the furs and oil. Sometimes life throws a curveball at you, and after reaching that remote place the guys couldn't find any tin to mine, and on top of that it seems the seals hadn't turned up for the hunting party. They couldn't go back empty handed since explorations were an expensive endeavor. They decided to head back to Auckland Island and explore there. It was a Thursday. On December 31, 1863, not a good day for a sailor, strong winds battered the ship. The water broke in all directions and a thick fog surrounded the vessel. These bad conditions remained, but on New Year's Day the men got sight of the island. As they approached they saw a large number of seals, so that lifted the men's moods. But then the bad weather again started to batter the ship. They managed to drop both anchors, but in the strong winds, heavy rain, and rough seas they couldn't steady the ship. At around midnight a violent gale blew the ship against the rocks. The water rushed into the ship, and in no time the ocean was spilling onto the deck. The men abandoned all hope of pumping the water out and instead gathered up as many provisions as they could. The ship was wrecked, it was a lost cause. They did get close enough to the island to get their things and leave the ship though. They were at least alive, but none of those five men could envision what awaited them. With them they had some food, they had tools as well as a gun and gunpowder. For a shelter they could use bits of the ship including the sails. They got to work. A week passed and the men hadn't been able to get much done due to awful weather and vicious winds. But when things cleared up they got to work on the shelter. With timber from the boat as well as cloth from the sails, it wasn't that hard to knock up a shelter. It helped that one of the crew members had experience in this and he at least had a combination hammer, something similar to an axe and a drill. In time they had a stable cabin to live in. Soon it would have a chimney so they could have a fire in the place and that let the smoke out. It had a table and to sleep on the men made what looked like stretchers. Weeks passed and the provisions were running out, but those seals they were virtually everywhere and the men listened to them roar as they slept which was like music to their ears. In fact when they woke up there'd be seals right outside their shelter so the closest one got it and ended up seal meat. Living only on seal meat wasn't exactly the best diet and the men didn't want to come down with scurvy so they started looking for other food sources. Luckily around the island there were widgeons which are kinda like ducks. Those were very tasty. The guys also found that older seals tasted horrible, but if you could get a cub that had never even been in the water it was delicious. On eating that for the first time Musgrave remarked, it tastes like lamb. The larger seals it turned out didn't much like those two legged animals taking their cubs and on occasion they put up a fight. They were soon scared off when the men fired a gun. It wasn't always seal for dinner though, the guys also ate a lot of fish and crabs. As deserted islands go, this wasn't the worst of places at times. Nonetheless, as the months passed, the men started wondering how long it would take for an expedition to find them if anyone was looking for them at all. The fact was those guys had long been thought of as dead. Only two months had passed when Musgrave wrote this in his diary. I am in exceedingly low spirits today, and I know that one loved one in Sydney is so also. For I have no doubt but by this time they have given me up for lost, and what is to become of my own dear wife and children? May God, to whom they can now look for comfort, watch over and protect them, is my constant and fervent prayer. I shall never forgive myself for coming on this enterprise. What could they do to pass the time? Well, they worked on that house of theirs and with all the timber they needed they made a pretty decent abode. It kept out the cold, had an area for working, a kitchen area, and a warm fire. On top of that they would managed to keep the mosquitoes out, and that had been an annoyance. Some seal clubbing days things didn't always go to plan. In fact on one particular day a tiger seal had taken offense to the clubbing of one of his young friends and one of the men had to hide up a tree until the others came to his rescue. What Musgrave would call pitched battles with seals would become quite a regular occurrence. After months passed the major battle was misery. The days were long and the weather was terrible and the men lost all hope of ever leaving the island. They played games and they made up their own dominoes, but there was only so much they could do to keep their spirits up. Their spirits were lifted considerably when one of the men made a huge breakthrough. What was that you might ask? The answer is the man had successfully made his own hooch, a kind of prison beer that didn't taste too bad. 
He made this from a flour that grew all over the island, which he then fermented. They now had beer on tap for as long as they wanted, and it also became another part of their mixed diet. After a few months and a lot of drinks, they also had taught the parrots they had to talk, which was some amusement for them. Still, on May 15th, Musgrave wrote, Oh my god, how long is this to last? Oh, release me from this bondage. Night and morning, day and in my dreams, I offer up my prayers to thee. They had better fishing techniques, but then in June the seals disappeared, and their main food source was gone. The water was warmer and the seals spent most of their time in the water. Hunting them became difficult. Now came the hunger. Months passed and the seals finally returned. The men had food, but no hope of ever seeing a ship sail close to the island. In October, Musgrave wrote, It would be impossible for me to convey to anyone an idea of my present state of mind. I am anything but mad. If that would come, it would very likely afford relief. It was that month that the men realized that they had to get off the island. Food wasn't always available and there were periods of terrible hunger. Their health was affected, but some had been injured while out hunting and surveying. Things weren't looking good. Building a ship to sail through rough waters isn't quite as easy as the movies depict, and without an expert or even a carpenter, Musgrave wrote that the idea of just making a ship that wouldn't sink in a second seemed farcical to him. Nonetheless, the men collected as many parts of the wreckage as they could and discussed how they'd build this thing. If anything, they had time in the day to think and build. Besides bouts of hunger, the men managed to start putting something together that looked seaworthy. Musgrave wrote, I hope we may succeed. It's quite true that by energetic perseverance, men may perform wonders, and our success would by no means constitute a miracle. The men are all very sanguine, and I have no doubt but we shall be able to make something that will carry us to New Zealand. Sanguine means positive, if you didn't know that. Over a year had passed and there had been failed attempts to launch their homemade boat. Some days were spent fixing that thing and others were spent in hunger and looking for grubs to eat. Musgrave put his diary down for months and then in spring he picked it back up again. The men are in what he calls a deplorable state, skinny and dressed in rags. They face grim starvation at times and almost want to gnaw on their own hands. In June, Musgrave wrote, we were all seized with a violent attack of dysentery about the same time. This we have all recovered from, but I am left with rheumatic pains and cramps, which will in all probability cling to me through life. But it's time to launch the boat. Even though they accept there is little probability of success, they will not survive much longer on the island, but the thought of drowning also weighs heavily on their minds. One thing that did lift their spirits was the discovery of a cat, which stayed with them while they finished their vessel. On the 27th of June, they launched the boat, which was so frightening some of the men wanted to return to the island. After attempts to sail were made, it was clear that five men were just too heavy, and it was decided that two men would be left behind, and if the others made it home, they would send out a ship to collect them. The three finally managed to sail to Stewart Island, which was inhabited. There, they met a Captain Cross, the first human they'd seen in 18 months. This is what Musgrave wrote. When we landed, I could not stand, but was led up to that gentleman's house, where something to eat was immediately prepared for us, of which I partook very sparingly, for I felt ill and unable to eat. Weeks passed, but the men and Captain Cross eventually made it back to the island, where they hoped the two men that were left behind were still alive. This is how Musgrave described the joyous meeting. One of them, the cook, on seeing me, turned as pale as a ghost and staggered up to a post, against which he leaned for support for he was evidently on the point of fainting, while the other, George, seized my hand in both of his and gave my arm a severe shaking, crying, Captain Musgrave, how are ye, how are ye? What's more incredible is that four months after those men had been shipwrecked on that island, another ship had been destroyed and another group of sailors were trying to survive on another part of the island. Both groups had no idea the other was on the island. On that other ship, only 19 of the 25 men got to shore and the others drowned. They didn't have the same luck and there was less to eat, and in the end only three survived when they were seen by a passing ship. Some died of starvation, others were abandoned. In their case, it was every man for himself rather than the collaboration Musgrave enjoyed with his men. One of the three survivors said things were grim and at one point two men got in a fight and one killed the other. The next morning, the winner of that fight was eating the loser. You might have heard about people getting stuck in airports due to visa issues or other matters relating to bureaucracy, but what about someone who just lives there, like chooses to live there? The man we're going to talk about today, it seems, has made an airport his home, but that isn't because he can't leave. His name is Denis Luis de Souza. He's Brazilian and his address is somewhere in Terminal 2, Sao Paulo Guarulhos International Airport, Brazil. He moved there in the year 2000 and from what we can see, he's still there now. But how can this happen? How does he get by? How come he's allowed to stay? Let's have a look. 
Dennis is now in his mid-30s and from interviews he's given, it seems he arrived at the airport as a young man who was having problems at home. We're assuming he intended for it to be a short-term solution and had no idea that he would end up making the airport his home for two whole decades. Dennis's main living space is in Terminal 2. It's there that he beds down for the night after the last international flight is taken off, and the terminal is quiet. His bed is three seats in a waiting area, though he does have at least a blanket and pillow. You might think that he'd be thrown out the moment staff realize that he's not there because of a delayed flight or a ticket mix-up. Quite to the contrary, he actually receives help from the airport staff. They give him food, wash his clothes, and allow him to leave what few belongings he has in certain places. One waitress who works at the airport regularly gives him lunch boxes. She said he's a nice guy, funny, and he's always honest. When he wakes up in the morning, he might get some rice and beans, and one article said he even gets a free latte from McDonald's. Well done, Ronald and crew. But why show such kindness to this airplane terminal resident? Well, beside the fact that he's a human being deserving of dignity, just like every other person is. Some reports we found said Dennis might have some issues with his mental well-being, but these issues don't stop him from getting along with the airport staff. Brazilian news media wrote that Dennis knows just about everyone there, from the baggage handlers to the security. An article in the Brazilian version of the Spanish newspaper El País, which we translated to English, stated that it's hard to understand what's going on in Dennis's mind. His sentences are short, incomplete, he does not distinguish the difference between a month and a week, and does not know how to tell the time if not on a digital clock. The article went on to say that Dennis can't read, but he likes to walk with a newspaper tucked under his arm. It added that while he lives in the airport, he can't talk about international destinations, so he may have some difficulties with learning or memory, and sadly it seems he has no other place to go. A person who works in the airport had this to say about him. Dennis needs psychological or psychiatric treatment. He lives in his world but needs a diagnosis and someone to take care of him. The person said Dennis has no idea that he's lived in the airport for almost 20 years and that he has completely lost track of time. One of the major struggles for Dennis, and for anyone who has to spend an extended time in an airport, is personal hygiene. He might get a few hygiene products from the pharmacy that have been bought for him by the kind airport employees, but apparently he only manages to get a really good clean on Saturdays. But kindness knows no bounds. Listen to what another airport staff member said about Dennis and his only friends. Every Christmas a commander pays a hotel to have him sleep in a bed and take a proper shower. Apparently Dennis doesn't mind leaving the airport then, and will come back after his night in a hotel and talk about all the great food he got through room service. Some of the airport staff are reluctant to try and persuade Dennis to try and move out because they fear he has nowhere to go. The streets will eat him up. He might have fallen through the cracks, but the airport has served as a kind of safety net. Dennis knows the rules. Don't annoy people and never ask for anything, and those rules he follows. Another article about Dennis stated that someone at the airport said there were actually five people in total who lived there without any intention of ever boarding a plane. It was somewhere they could be almost comfortably homeless. In 2019, it was reported that people in the homeless population of San Francisco had taken to going to San Francisco International Airport in large numbers, seeing it as a safe place to rest and get out of the elements, and that it's only been increasing as the homelessness crisis in California has gotten worse. Though in San Francisco, it seems officials have been trying to find ways to get these people to shelters, and we doubt anyone would be able to make the airport their home for years on end like Dennis. It's happened in other airports in the US too over the years, but authorities have taken a hard line against what it calls violators. One homeless person in the US was quoted in The Guardian saying, sleeping at the airport was peaceful, quiet, and heartwarming. You didn't have to worry about people stealing your stuff or robbing you. You might have heard about another famous case of a person living a long time in an airport. Almost as long as Dennis has been staying at his terminal. A man named Miran Karimi Nasseri was the inspiration for the movie The Terminal and lived in Terminal 1 of Charles de Gaulle Airport in France from 1988 to 2006. There's a bit of controversy surrounding his case though. It was first reported that he was expelled from Iran, but subsequent reports state that this might not have been the case. We know he was on his way to the UK, but it said he lost his briefcase and papers on the way, so he got stuck in France. He did get to British immigration, but since he had no passport, he got sent back. He was stuck. So what did he do? Well, like Dennis, he made the best out of a bad situation. The French police actually arrested him, but the thing was, he hadn't really done anything illegal. It was legal for him to have entered the airport. He just had no way out of there. Miron certainly had a lot of downtime and he read a lot during his years at the airport. 
Like Dennis, airport staff did their best to look after him and one manager of a bar at the airport had this to say about him. He was like a part of the airport, everyone knows him. Another airport employee said, he's one of us, we even get letters for him. He followed a routine, which meant getting up at 5.30 every morning. He would shave in the restroom and wash and then go out to get his books and read all day. At night, when the stores were closed, he would wash again and brush his teeth, which he did with the help of complimentary airline kits. He'd also wash his clothes at night and then let them dry. He actually had a fair amount of clothes since he'd been traveling when he began his airport life and so unlike Dennis, he didn't really need to rely on his many handouts. Someone once offered him some new clothes but he turned them down saying he was not a beggar. He did accept food though because he had no choice. Eventually he became ill and was forced to leave the airport. He ended up at a shelter in Paris and from there he wrote a book called The Terminal Man. Then there's the strange case of a Japanese man called Hiroshi Nohara. His story is different from the others because he wasn't homeless or mentally ill and he had all his documents in order. One day, he simply chose not to leave the airport and gave no reason why he made that choice. Hiroshi arrived at Mexico City's Benito Juarez International Airport in 2008 and he would end up living there for almost four months despite having a return ticket home to Japan. Like the others, he managed to survive in part thanks to a lot of help. Fast food chains helped him out by giving him free food, but some of them started branding shirts, caps, and mugs with Hiroshi's face on them because he had become a bit of a celeb, so it seems they might have viewed it more as a marketing opportunity than a charitable one. Hiroshi looked a bit disheveled with his scraggly beard, but that only added to his mystique. Journalists visited him and he always refused to say why he wouldn't go home or leave the airport. One day, a woman named Oyuki turned up at the airport and he left with her. Staff said that they didn't even say goodbye, he just vanished, and we may never know why Hiroshi did what he did. In China, a man named Wei Jianguo has been in Beijing Capital International Airport for over a decade. He said he was sick of his home life and the rules he faced there. In one interview, he said his wife didn't allow him to drink, and at the airport he can drink as much as he wants and eat what he wants. He actually said, I can go back anytime I want, but I won't be allowed to drink. The China Daily newspaper describing his day said that he wakes up and has his breakfast, then with his lunch he starts on a Chinese white spirit called Baizhu. He proceeds to drink with abandon and does this routine daily. The cops sometimes throw him out, but he always manages to get back in. My family told me that if I wanted to stay, I had to quit smoking and drinking. If I couldn't do that, I had to give them all my monthly government allowance of 1,000 won, about 150 bucks. But then, how would I buy my cigarettes and alcohol? Indeed, Wei, what was she thinking? A worker at the airport said there were others who had made the place their home, and much like the people who are homeless in other countries, many have mental health issues. The China Daily actually found one of the airport dwellers, and he told them that he had no recollection of his life before he started living in the airport. Security workers said as long as they don't cause any trouble and keep their heads down, then they won't report them. It's not always the homeless who are forced to live in airports, though. In fact, the world's most famous whistleblower had to spend quite a bit of time in an airport. Edward Snowden, an NSA contractor who leaked numerous documents detailing the way the US government was surveilling people with the help from telecommunications companies, spent 39 days living in Moscow's Sheremetyevo International Airport while waiting on an asylum request. He was stuck in the arrivals transit area, but he did at least get a room there. It's reported that for a few hours in the day he could look around for food and there was a sink where he could wash himself and his clothes. You must now be thinking, could this ever happen to me? After all, you're not likely on the run from a US intelligence agency and unlike the tight-lipped Japanese man, it's unlikely you'll do anything crazy on a whim because you're just not like that. But what if you just got a bit unlucky? This happened to a 52-year-old British man named Gary Peter Austin, who'd been in the Philippines on vacation. He was on his way back to the UK, but he missed his flight. He didn't have enough cash to buy another flight, and thus he became stranded at Ninoy Aquino International Airport in Manila. The guy really didn't know what to do, and since he was out of cash, things went from bad to worse. But again, it was the kindness of airport staff that saved the day, a fact that he has in common with many of the other people in this same situation that's really helping to restore our faith in humanity. During his stay at the departure lounge, airport workers fed him and even passed a hat around to collect money for him. One of the airport workers said this about Gary in an interview with the Global Nation. He slept on the gang chairs with his red luggage. He used the bathroom and changed clothes and kept himself neat. They didn't report him, but as time went by, they thought it a bit strange that he couldn't get out of there. Didn't he have any family to help him? He even had to spend Christmas and the New Year at the airport. It seems someone eventually helped him out with money and he got home after 22 days. It seems like this really could happen to anyone. 
The date is August 14, 1961. The location, a dingy basement in the American Central Intelligence Agency's West Berlin headquarters. Just a few miles distant lies the Soviet KGB's own headquarters, both sides separated by a political demarcation splitting Germany into East under influence of the Soviet Union and the Democratic West under the protection of the United States and its allies. For years, a secret spy war has waged between both sides the life of each operative always just a single trigger pull away from ending. Or at least that's what the man claims to be and want. He appears to be in his late 30s or early 40s, a tall, handsome man with dark hair, a clean-shaven face, and an easy-going manner. Nothing about him screams assassin, and yet the man insists that he is one responsible for at least two major political assassinations on the Soviet side of Europe. The American agents interrogating him are skeptical. The West German intelligence officer assisting his American partners is less skeptical. Go on, the German officer nods. Tell us how it happened. Stashinsky takes a sip of water and clears his throat. It's now October 1957 and the weather is pleasantly cool. Stashinsky sits on a park bench in the middle of Munich, newspaper on his lap. To all appearances, he's nothing more than another German citizen enjoying the mild weather. In reality, he's a dangerous predatory animal carefully eyeballing every man who crosses his path. He's looking for his prey, and he knows he'll find him soon. Originally, Stashinsky was instructed to abduct Lev Rebet, the editor of a Ukrainian nationalistic newspaper that called for the independence of Ukraine from the Soviet Union. Needless to say, this didn't sit well with the Soviet government, and with the paper's growing influence, something had to be done to stop the agitators. Six months after his original tasking to abduct Rebet, the KGB changed its mind and encouraged the assassination of Rebet instead. The Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev personally approved of the killing, and soon Stashinsky found himself with different orders – kill Lev Rebet and leave no witnesses. Stashinsky watches the crowd carefully as it moves. He's been here in the city center for two days knowing that eventually Rebet will appear. He doesn't have to wait long, and early on the second day, Stashinsky spots Rebet from a distance as he steps off a train and immediately picks up his newspaper and begins to follow him. Rabbit has only minutes left to live now. Hidden in the rolled up newspaper is a very simple device, a single shot, single barreled pipe gun of sorts, loaded with a nearly foolproof tool for assassination, a capsule of potassium cyanide. The weapon fires the capsule directly into the face of its victim, which bursts on impact, releasing a small cloud of the deadly poison. Within seconds, the victim will be unconscious, moments later, dead, and best of all, any medical examination that doesn't look too closely will determine the cause of death to be nothing more than a simple heart attack. Now, Stashinsky follows Revit, the deadly weapon hidden in his newspaper. On an ankle holster, Stashinsky carries a small revolver, just in case there are any witnesses. Nobody can be left alive to tell the tale of Revit's death, and certainly not to link it back to the people who most want him dead, the Soviet Union. Revit leads Stashinsky through the streets of Berlin, finally arriving at his apartment block. He opens the front door and lets himself in. Stashinsky slipping in behind him just before the door closes. Revit begins to climb the stairs to the second floor, completely unaware of the deadly assassin stalking his every step. Stashinsky clears his throat. The surprised Revit immediately spins around to face him, only to stare into the barrel of the deadly poison gun. With a silent hiss, the weapon fires, a potassium cyanide capsule bursting directly in Revit's face. Revit staggers forward but falls to the floor. The assassination has been perfect no witnesses, and the medical examiners will discover only a small amount of potassium cyanide in Revit's system, not enough to trigger suspicions that his death was anything but natural. Back in 1961, the CIA officers looked skeptical. A poison gun that shoots potassium cyanide capsules? That sounds ridiculous to them, pure fantasy. They're growing less and less convinced by the minute that this man is truly who he says he is, let alone a Soviet assassin. The German officer, however, isn't so sure. An autopsy of Rebet did discover potassium cyanide in his system, and the same was discovered in another prominent political enemy of the Soviet Union just two years later. Could the two be connected? Tell me more, Herr Stashinsky. It's once more October, but this time it's 1959, two years after the assassination of Lev Rebet. Today, the target is another Ukrainian antagonist, a political leader now living in exile from his former home and still calling for independence from the Soviet Union, Stepan Bandera. This has naturally placed him in the crosshairs of the KGB. Bandera lives in Munich on an apartment block at Kreitmeier Street, not far from his office. Stashinsky has been watching Bandera closely for months. The man is not easy to track or to approach. Bandera is all too aware that he has a target on his back and has been careful to mix up his routines and maintain tight security at all times. This has made pinning down his commute in best places to ambush him very difficult. 
Stashinsky has already tried to penetrate Bandera's home on a previous occasion, but the lockpicking tools provided him by the KGB failed to open the lock on the front door of the apartment building. He tried his own key to see if perhaps they were similar enough, but that too failed and actually broke off in the lock. Panicked, Stashinsky called off the assassination attempt, fearful that the sabotaged lock might give the plot away. Lucky for him, the building inspector fixed the lock and suspected no foul play. Bandera remained unaware of just how close he had come to death. Stashinsky was determined to kill him on his first trip though, and as he followed closely from behind through the streets of Munich, Bandera happened to glance behind him and spot Stashinsky, making the assassin fear he'd been made. The hit was called off. But now, weeks later, Stashinsky is determined to at last get his victim. He's filed down one of his own keys to match the lock to Bandera's apartment building door, and he undertakes a quick trial run to ensure it works. Sure enough, the key fits and the door opens. The assassination is a go. The next day, Stashinsky takes a yellow pill meant to protect him from potassium cyanide he'd be using to kill Bandera with. His weapon is an improved version of the one he used two years ago, featuring two barrels which will allow him to ensure a deadly dose is delivered. The assassin makes his way to the Ludwig Bridge near the German Museum in Munich and from there finds a place to observe the Ukrainian emigre office. He spots Bandera's car, and about an hour later, at 1130 hours, Stashinsky watches a man and a woman exit the office and enter Bandera's vehicle, driving down the street. He's not close enough to identify the man, but is convinced it's Bandera. Stashinsky decides to simply wait for Bandera at his home, and takes a streetcar to the apartment building Bandera lives in under a fake name. He finds a place to sit and observe the street, and not long after, spots Bandera's car drive past him. Bandera, who is typically escorted by a bodyguard everywhere he goes, is completely alone. Now is the time to strike. Stashinsky watches Bandera drive into the apartment building's garage and quickly makes his way inside the building using his filed down key. He heads up the stairs and takes a perch in between the ground and second floor. It's still early in the afternoon and the building is quiet, there's no foot traffic coming or going, perfect for an assassination. Suddenly, there's the sound of a door opening somewhere above Stashinsky and two women bidding goodbye to each other. Stashinsky tries to calm his nerves and wills the woman to quickly move to the elevator and take her leave. She doesn't. She decides to take the stairs. Stashinsky grips the weapon hidden in his newspaper roll. It has two barrels, two charges. He could kill two people with it if need be. The woman draws nearer, and at the last second, Stashinsky decides against killing her. He moves down the stairs and begins to fiddle with the elevator button, pretending to be waiting for it. The woman passes him and exits the building. The moment the door closes behind her, Stashinsky curses silently and rushes back toward the stairs. But before he can take more than two steps toward the stairs, the front door once more opens. It's Bandera, and he's spotted Stashinsky. For one brief moment, the assassin fears that the game is up. Maybe Bandera will run. Maybe he'll reach for his weapon. Stashinsky is only armed with the poison gun useless except at point-blank range. Bandera would surely kill him before he could get that close. It's well known that the Ukrainian leader in exile always carries a firearm in a shoulder holster. The question racing through Stashinsky's mind is, does he recognize me? Did he spot me weeks ago as I was following him and he happened to glance over his shoulder directly at me? Will he remember my face? Bandera does not. He nods briefly at Stashinsky before turning his attention back to extricating his key from the front door. His arms are loaded with groceries and he's having trouble removing the key from the sticky lock. His back turned to the deadly Soviet assassin standing only a dozen feet away. Stashinsky makes his move, it's now or never. Walking to the door, Stashinsky grabs the front door knob as if to help Bandera. Doesn't it work? asks Stashinsky, causing Bandera to look directly at him. Yeah, it works, comes the reply. As Bandera turns to look and answer Stashinsky's question, he's met by both barrels of the poison gun. Two capsules of potassium cyanide burst at point-blank range in Bandera's face, and the Ukrainian leader staggers backwards. Groceries fall to the floor as Bandera struggles to free his pistol from his holster hidden under his jacket. It's too late for him, though. Stashinsky doesn't even wait to confirm Bandera's death. He walks out the door and closes it behind him as Bandera falls to the floor. The massive dose of poison takes only seconds to kill him. The police will find him with his hand still clutching at the weapon in its holster. Back in 1961 once more, the Americans still aren't buying it. A poison gas gun? Who ever heard of such a thing? What a load of hooey. The CIA agents don't believe Stashinsky or his stories and make a recommendation to headquarters that he is useless as a double agent and is possibly a Soviet mole himself. 
His stories don't add up, and the CIA releases him to the West German intelligence service. The Germans, however, aren't as skeptical of Stashinsky's stories. They have Stashinsky walk them through a recreation of the murders and become increasingly convinced that he's the real deal. Given his incredible familiarity with the murder scenes, maybe he can be a valuable intelligence asset. But first, he has to answer for his crimes. As a valuable asset, Stashinsky is jailed for only eight years. Shortly after his release, the CIA changes its mind on Stashinsky and brings him into the fold. They eventually provide new identities for him and his German wife and fly them to South Africa, where he's granted asylum. But not before he delivers a gold mine of intelligence to the West on Soviet operations. Sometimes, life changes unexpectedly in the blink of an eye. A previously unknown allergic reaction, a lightning strike, a slip and a fall. Freak accidents that forever alter existences. The Robertson family once experienced an extreme version of this. They were over a year into an amazing sailing trip around the world, when an unusual calamity suddenly changed their lives forever, forcing them into a life or death struggle for survival upon the high seas. The plan to sail around the world began as a whim. In the fall of 1968, the Robertson family parents, Dougal and Lynn, 16-year-old daughter Anne, 17-year-old Douglas, and 9-year-old twins Neil and Sandy were living a hand-to-mouth, hardscrabble existence running a dairy farm in Staffordshire, UK. One night, Dougal was telling the twins bedtime stories of his stint in the British Merchant Navy when Neil asked if the family could sail around the world. Dougal laughed at the idea. The farm was on the verge of bankruptcy. His kids would get to experience travel and life in other countries in a unique way, so why not? The Robertson sold Meadow Farm and purchased the Lucette, a 50-year-old 19-ton, 43-foot schooner. On January 21, 1971, the Robertsons set out aboard the Lucette, departing from Falmouth, England. Other than Dougal, none of the family had sailing experience. Immediately, the Robertsons had a trial-by-fire experience. Six days into their trip, while sailing through the Bay of Biscay off the coast of France, they were caught in a fierce storm with 40-foot waves and 60-mile-per-hour winds. Thankfully, the family survived the storm, learning to sail as they went along. They spent the next 17 months sailing the Caribbean, stopping in ports of calls such as Antigua and Barbados. Eventually, Anne met a young man, fell in love, and decided to stay in the Bahamas. The rest of the family sailed on, visiting the Panama Canal. Along the way, the Robertsons took on a 22-year-old Welsh hitchhiker, Robin Williams, as a deckhand. He was going to sail with them all the way to New Zealand. Robin rapidly became an informal part of the family. June 15, 1972 began as a pleasant, typical morning on board the Lucette. The Robertsons were sailing about 200 miles west of the Galapagos Islands. They were two days into a 40-day trip to the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. Boom! Just before 10 a.m., something slammed into the hull of the Lucette with the force of a torpedo. The boat shuddered, lifting into the air. In rapid succession, two more hits battered the boat. There was a thunderous cracking sound as the hull split. Three orcas had rammed the boat. The unusual frenzied attack was over as quickly as it had started, the killer whales vanishing back into the depths of the ocean. But the blows had dealt the Lucette a fatal structural problem. She was sinking, and fast. Pandemonium ensued as the family scrambled to launch an inflatable emergency raft in a small dinghy. There was no time to radio for help. Lynn was still in her nightgown when they abandoned ship. Though Lynn and Douglas had close calls, thankfully everyone safely made it aboard the emergency raft. Within about a minute, the Lucette was gone. The Robertsons were left dazed and disbelieving of the sudden turn life had taken. Floating around them in the water was flotsam from the Lucette. Drifting nearby, tethered to the raft, was their 10-foot dinghy, which they had christened Ednamir. Ednamir was half-filled with water and riding low in the ocean. The inflatable raft they were sitting on wasn't much better. During deployment, it had somehow accidentally been punctured. Dougal took charge and the family began rescuing whatever they could from the water, mainly Lynn's sewing basket which turned out to have needles, both knitting and thread, some razors, a ball of strong yarn, a ballpoint pen, etc. The family also had inventoried their supplies. In the emergency kit for the raft, they had vitamin-fortified bread and glucose, enough for 10 men for two days, 18 pints of water, 8 flares, a signal mirror, a baler, a first aid kit three paddles, and assorted fishing gear. In their mad dash to abandon ship, they'd grabbed a bag of a dozen onions, a tin of biscuits, ten oranges, six lemons, and a bag of candy. They also had some large snails and some sailing gear. Things were looking grim for the family. They were caught in a strong current. It was nearly impossible to row the 200 miles back to the Galapagos Islands. They were over 1,000 miles northeast of the coast of South America and over 2,000 miles west of their original destination of the Marquesas Islands. They weren't adrift near any shipping lanes, so their chances of being sighted and rescued were slim. 
Even with extreme rationing, their water wouldn't last long. Worse yet, no one knew that their boat had sank and that they were lost at sea. Rather than sailing toward land, Dougal and Douglas came up with the idea of sailing north 400 miles to an area of the ocean where the northern and southern trade winds collide, called the doldrums. The doldrums are known for their calm water and mild surface winds. It also frequently rained there. The Robertsons would have fresh water. After the doldrums, they would assess where to go next, but would probably try to sail toward America. This route would take them through the shipping lanes that go to Australia and New Zealand from America, increasing their chances of rescue. The next seven days were difficult. The Robertsons bailed out the Edna Mare. They reorganized their supplies to maximize space, storing them in the smaller dinghy which they firmly tethered to the raft. Dougal assigned a watch schedule and sleeping positions for everyone. He tried as best he could to sketch out on a scrap paper the direction they should sail in. The family battled seasickness. The dip and sway of the tiny raft was much different than sailing in a boat. Lynn often recited the Lord's Prayer and sang hymns. She devised a set of stretching exercises for everyone to do to help create a routine and maintain their muscles. Just in case, they cut part of a sail and wrote goodbye letters ahead of time while they were still lucid. Lynn and the twins wrote letters for Anne, while Robin wrote one for his mother. The letters were put into waterproof wrapping and tucked into a pocket of the raft. The castaways carefully rationed the food and after some missteps, figured out how to catch fish to supplement their meager supplies. They drank spinal cord fluid and sucked on fish eyes to slake their thirst. They also dried strips of fish for later. Unfortunately, catching and cleaning fish attracted nine-foot sharks to circle the raft. Day by day, the leak on the raft kept growing, though they kept trying to patch it. Their mouths grew sore from taking turns blowing up the raft to replace lost air. They were wet and cold all the time, as there was always water in the bottom of the raft. Only the thwart seat stayed dry, and they would take hour-long turns sitting on it. Lynn would often give up her turn for her younger sons. Their sunburned skin became encrusted with salt and broke out in painful boils. On day 7, the Robertsons spotted a ship in the distance. They used up all three of their rocket flares trying to signal the boat. They became extremely disheartened that the ship didn't see them and sailed on. Eventually, they reached the doldrums. Dougal fashioned a spear and managed to catch a sea turtle. In addition to eating the turtle, they drank its blood. It had rained briefly once or twice since they were shipwrecked, not enough to collect the supply of drinking water, but the bottom of the Edmare had collected a few inches of brackish water mixed with bits of offal and turtle blood. The liquid wasn't safe to drink, but worried about the lack of bowel movements, Lynn, who had training as a nurse, administered enemas to her family using rubber tubes stripped from the rungs of the raft ladder. When taken rectally, the liquid was less poisonous. It wouldn't travel through the digestive system. Robin declined the treatment. Over the next several days, Lynn would periodically administer more enemas, eventually switching to turtle oil rather than water. Finally, 16 days after the shipwreck, it rained. And then it rained some more, all night in fact. After the initial joyous relief of getting fresh water, there was a new problem, too much water. The Robertsons took turns bailing out the raft in the Edna-Mare. Finally, on the 17th day, they had to abandon the raft. Patching and bailing couldn't keep it afloat any longer. The castaways moved to the Edna Mare, having carefully thought out which items from the raft they could take with them into the cramped space. The Robertsons put up a sail and steered northeast, taking turns rowing when there was no wind. The rain caused mold to grow on the strips of dried fish and turtle meat they had carefully been preserving. They gorged on what they could and discarded the rest. The rain continued on and off the next few days. More than once, they thought they spotted something in the distance, and a few times even used a precious flare or torch to try and attract attention. Since the wreck of the Lucette, there had been many arguments and tense standoffs between the castaways. Dougal especially had an explosive temper. On day 23, the Robertsons got caught in a storm that lasted most of the afternoon and late into the night. There was thunder and lightning with torrential rain. Even worse, the Edna Mare was in severe danger of being swamped by waves. Everyone was exhausted from bailing. At one point, Robin had to rub feeling back into Dougal's dead, tired, ice-cold arms. After hours of battling the storm, Douglas thought that his dad was ready to give up. But then his mom looked at his dad and held his eyes. Then his dad said, bail for your lives and bail twice as quick as you're doing now. Reinvigorated, they did. They also sang songs to help stay awake and stay warm. Somehow, they made it until dawn when the storm began to quiet. Every day was a new lesson in misery. By now, the castaways' clothes were rotting off their bodies. It hurt to sit in a single position for very long. There was little padding on their bones. Also, their tender, boil-infested skin would break open, sting from the salt, and weep pus. Their hands and arms were crisscrossed with cuts and scratches from catching sea turtles, which had razor-sharp claws. 
The Robertson's lowest point came when they lost their water reserves. They had a couple of tanks of water which were tied together and hung off the side of the boat. While trying to catch an angry sea turtle, the creature slashed the rope with its claws and the water tanks floated away before the Robertsons could rescue them. They were left trying to save rainwater in a plastic bag and small cuffs. On July 23, 1972, their 38th day adrift, at twilight the Robertsons spotted a Japanese fishing trawler, the Tokumaru 2. Dougal lit a flare, waved it like a madman, and tossed it high into the air when it burned his hands. He was frantically trying to light another flare when the ship turned toward the raft. They had been spotted. The Robertsons were extremely dehydrated, their mouths so dry and their tongues so swollen with thirst they could hardly talk. The fishermen didn't speak much English anyway, and the castaways know Japanese. However, the two groups were able to communicate through hand signals. The Robertsons convinced the fishermen to save their stinky battered dinghy when they would have abandoned the Edna Mare at sea. The Tokumaru 2 took the castaways to Panama, where the British Embassy put them up in a hotel and gave them medical care. Slowly, they made full recoveries. Ten days after being rescued, Robin flew home to England. The Robertson family returned to their home country at a more leisurely pace, sailing home via ship, although this time a large one, the MV Port Auckland. Dougal and Lynn's marriage disintegrated, haunted by the arguments they had while shipwrecked. Lynn went back to farming. Dougal returned to sailing and wrote a book about his family's survival experience. Many years later, Douglas also wrote a book, weaving in and expanding on portions of his father's book. And now, you've got an ordeal to take on for yourself, choosing between these two videos. We know you're going to want to watch both, but you can only pick one, so make a decision quickly and pick one now.